My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Tuesday, Oops, August so 30th, oh, right. yeah. 2016. Mm -hmm. And I'm here with Chava Weisler at her home in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Mm -hmm. Chava, do I have your permission to record this interview? Absolutely. Great. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your involvement um, in Verbrengen and the impact that the Chavara has had on you personally mm -hmm. and, uh, and beyond in the larger Jewish community. So I'd like to start by um, talking about your personal and family background and to flush out a bit who you were mm -hmm. at the time that you mm -hmm. got involved first with Verbrengen. So let's begin with your family when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. so you were born in 1947. That's right. In Washington, D.C. That's right. So tell us briefly about your family when you were growing up. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Um, my parents uh, were born, both of them, in New York City. Um, they were both scientists, and but uh, it having been the Depression, they had very hard job, time getting jobs as scientists. And then when the Second World War started and the U.S. government needed scientists, First, my mother got a job at the National Bureau of Standards. She was a physicist. And then my father got a job, I think then, at the Naval Research Lab. He was a chemist. So they moved down uh, to D.C., um, along with a lot of other professional Jewish families. Um, thus, separating is interesting, separating from their own families um, uh, and staying out of all the family quarrels. <laughs> <laughs> a good thing. Uh, but uh, they had a they had actually a group of friends who were almost like my aunts and uncles growing up. Other other Jewish couples who had mostly moved down from New York. Was your mother unusual as a woman scientist in those years? Yes, she was. Um, and in fact, she she as as was the case with many women in those days. She only got a master's degree, and she got her master's degree at Columbia. And her professors said to her, "You're a woman and a Jew. You'll never get a job." I mean, some of them were Jewish. So, and her first, anyway, she was, I mean, her first job was as the, uh, as a secretary in a chemical company. And my father was teaching science in a vocational junior high school. But, so they jumped at the chance to get these better jobs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you have, two, you have two younger brothers. That's right, I do. Um, one of whom still lives with his family in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and the other of whom married and then later divorced a French woman. Um, he's a mathematician carrying on the family scientific tradition, and he lives in Paris, France, and his son lives there too. Uh -huh. uh, what about grandparents? You... So um, my father's parents were both from the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire, um, although my grandfather said he was from Galicia, I mean, he said he was from Austria. He was from Galician, Poland, Galicia. Um, and in fact, I have not been in the town he was from, but I have driven past it on the highway, Dembitsa in Polish, Dembitz in Yiddish. And, um, and my grandmother was from Hungary. Um, that grandfather, they all started out in the garment industry, I think all four of my grandparents, but my, um, that grandfather had a real talent, and he... Uh, grew up to design and manufacture ladies' coats and suits. Um, but my father's parents died when I was relatively young. They were influential in my Jewish development in two ways. One was that they were the Orthodox branch of the family, or the nominally Orthodox branch of the family. Uh, they were much more observant. They kept a kosher home. My mother's parents, by the time I knew them, were no longer keeping a kosher home. Um, uh, so I had that model, and one of my father's siblings, uh, his his older sister, also kept an Orthodox home. So that was that was where I saw that, um, and also by dying when I was relatively young, and my father said Kaddish for each of them every day. He would sometimes take me, probably on the weekends. I can't imagine he took me in the mornings during the year, but I remember going with him to say Kaddish and being exposed to that very traditional sort of davening, which deeply attracted me. The even mumble, as a young child. Even as a young child. I don't remember if I put this in my interview, my pre-interview notes, but I felt drawn to Judaism as a young child. Um, it, I felt like it was like having an ear for music, that is, and an ear for ritual, or a soul for ritual. That is, I loved especially 
the old guys and that davening, and I thought, will I ever be able to produce that liquid stream of syllables, you know? Um, and they seemed more authentic and sincere than the big conservative show we belonged to. Just to say briefly about my mother's parents, they were from the Russian Empire. Uh, my grandmother was from Romney in the Ukraine. My grandfather was in Kishinev. He was actually lived through the Kishinev pogrom as a boy. Um, he only told me about it once. This was, um, I was when I was going to library, library school in New York, and I asked him about it, and he so broke... you were in your 20s. Uh, yeah, and he broke down and wept when he told me the story. Um, and uh, I guess by that time I knew about the Kishinev pogrom, so I hadn't known about it as a child. Um, and he, uh, although he had almost no formal schooling, became a bookkeeper. Um, he was good at numbers, which my mother and one of my brothers inherited from him. So, um, and I have to say also about my grandmother, uh, she, um, she was perfectly happy to have girls. You know, she said when my, she, my mother has an older sister, when my, my mother was born, people came to condole her that she hadn't had a son. And she said, don't be silly, you know. Unlike my other grandmother who made, she had three boys and a girl who was the second child and she made my aunt's life miserable her entire life because she, was, she wasn't a boy. So, uh, so how would you describe the Jewish environment in your own home when you were growing so, up? Uh, we belonged to a conserv the big conservative shul in Washington, D.C., which was Addis Israel, Connecticut and Porter Streets. Um, most of my parents' friends, those aunts and uncles, as, a, as it were, uh, belonged to Reform temples. They, um, that's where the intellectual Jewish crowd belonged, but my father in particular wanted a more traditional uh, kind of service and a more traditional atmosphere, even though I don't think my parents felt socially very well accepted in Addis, as we called it. Um, a lot of people in business there government? Uh, well, I guess there were so some. I, I, there must have been some. I'm Probably the government people were over at Temple Sinai um, with Balfour Brickner, who was the big intellectual rabbi at the time. Um, and, you know, and we had the big pompous service with the cantor in his long robes and the high hat. And uh, But we also had as a big congregation so there was a children's service that met in the chapel on Shabbat morning and a teen service that met in another auditorium. And those were both influential in my life. But in my own family, uh, I, um, we had um, what you could call a Jewish treif home, that is, no pork or shellfish. Um, we did mix milk and meat. We had, we had uh, uh, supermarket meat. We didn't get kosher meat, and um, we had, starting from my very early childhood, we had Shabbat dinner every week. My mother lit candles, my father said Kiddush. Um, we had a special dinner. Um, when we moved to the house I lived in after I was 11, we had dinner in the dining room rather than in the, in the kitchen the way we did the rest of the time. Uh, my parents liked to go to synagogue something like once a month. Um, we observed in the house Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, and uh, Pesach. But my father liked to go to shul on Sukkot in particular, which also became my favorite holiday. Uh, I love the sukkah. I just love, I love the being outside. I love the connection to nature. I love the feeling that life is fragile. Um, it's, it's actually a big blow moving here is that I can no longer have a sukkah. Um, and... Um, I ate all my meals in the sukkah for decades, unless it was raining. And uh, so um, my parents viewed my Jewish involvement with a certain amount of wariness. When you were young? When I was young. What age are you talking about? Uh, from going to Camp Ramah when I was 12 and 13, when I wanted to keep kosher, when I benched out loud after lunch in junior high school. Um, uh, then in high school, when I got involved in Habunim, which was also very important for me, 
Um, you know, they thought I was becoming a little religious, you know, not a, a Zionist fanatic. They didn't want me to move to Israel. They, uh, and even my grandfather, my mother's father, who tried to persuade other people, other grandchildren to be more Jewish, said to me, you know, sort of like, how did you get into all this, you know, Jewish observance? You know, it was, he, 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 he thought it was extreme. Um, and... How did you? As I said, it drew me in from childhood, you know, I just loved it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, you know, various things influenced me from going to Daily Minion with my father to, yes, as I said, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the children's service where girls were allowed to lead things, to the teen service where girls were no longer allowed to lead things. Um, but where there was a nice chevra and they served us a good lunch, I still remember the lunches, it was tuna salad sandwiches on bridge rolls and potato chips. What are bridge rolls? Um, they're, um, well, they're, they're white, white sort of challah type rolls, but they're, sa they're shaped a little bit like a torpedo or something at both ends. Um, and maybe they had egg salad sandwiches too. Anyway, I remember the sandwiches. I do. I am into food. Uh, I also started trying to cook traditional Jewish things when I was already in high school. I tried to making tegla. I would make tegla for Rosh Hashanah. And how uh, did you know about those foods? <sighs> Your grandmother? I guess. I mean, my grandparents, of course, lived in New York. Um, uh, tegla, I think we bought, you know, in the Jewish deli. And then I thought, well, I could make this. And I went to the settlement cookbook and I found a recipe for it. And, you know, I, I liked to cook early on. Um, and uh, so, and my mother, my mother was, my mother had not known how to cook until she got married. And she was a laboratory scientist. She learned how to cook from cookbooks, following them like they were lab manuals. And so she taught me to measure extremely precisely. She says, you know, a little bit of this flour falls out. It gets anyway. My mother, my my father's mother was a was a very good cook, although she died when I was seven, and she could also make stretch strudel. She was Hungarian. She would, you know, um, and but my my mother's mother was a very good baker, and she made traditional Jewish things. Yeah, you started to talk about the impact of camp. Just one second. So camp, um, uh, both Camp Ramah in Connecticut for which the synagogue paid on scholarship for me to go, uh, as they did for a lot of kids, uh, for the whole summer. In those days, that's what you did. You did not go for part sessions. The whole summer, when I was 12 and 13, um, and then Habunim Camp, uh, the Baltimore and Washington kids together went to one camp near Annapolis in those days, Habunim Camp Mosheva, which has since moved, uh, and so does has Ramon, Connecticut, obviously moved to Massachusetts a long time ago. But anyway, I went to Ramah. Both of them had profound effects on me. So tell us about this. So uh, first of all, um, uh, I did have the model of observant life uh, at Ramah, although I did not feel... What year was this? Uh, let's see. I was 12 and 13, 59, 60. Um, and then I was 61, 62, 63 at uh, Habunim camp the last summer I was a madricha. Um, and uh, the, uh, I did not feel socially comfortable at Ramah, but, um, and I was, you know, it was also, it was clear they were trying to make American Jews, not Jews who wouldn't fit into American society in any way. Was interesting, but what do you mean by that? Uh, well, perhaps it's my later contrast with Habunim, where they were trying to make Israeli Jews out of us. Um, uh, also, Habunim was much more um, politically radical in a variety of ways. We proudly called ourselves socialists, uh, and at Ramah, there was they had dances that were like American dances for the kids with themes like Blue Moon or whatever. And uh, at Habonim camp, we had Israeli dancing, you know. So um, there were a lot of ways. I mean, I could think about it and say more. But in any case, what was important to me at Ramah was the daily davening and the classes. 
the Hebrew, um, which, as I may have written, the first summer I was in the lowest Hebrew class, and I was so motivated by it, because I felt I had, I, I'm pretty good at languages, so I felt I had broken the language barrier, that is, I could express myself in Hebrew, and that winter I bought myself grammar books, textbooks, books about Hebrew philology, and I taught myself Hebrew. And so I was in the second highest class the next summer. So um, that's how I know Hebrew. Uh, I taught it to myself. I would not have had I not spent that summer at Ramah, which pushed me in the summer at Ramah that consolidated it. And then by that second summer, we were studying Pirkei Avot, um, and uh, which also, you know, it's it's in Hebrew. So with, it was a it, it was a text with some challenge and. Um, you know, but also showed how much Hebrew I knew that I could study Pirkei Avot in Hebrew. Um, and then I got involved in Habunim. Why the switch? Why did you switch? Well, I think probably because uh, there were a couple of Hebrew school teachers who were involved in Habunim. Um, they were two of the Cohen brothers. Ovadia Cohen was my Hebrew school teacher and Shlomo Cohen was another Hebrew school teacher at Addis, and they were part of the really strong Baltimore Jewish community. And um, uh, and they were um, they were uh, you know the Baltimore and Washington Habonim groups went to the same camp. Although partly, it, I think it appealed to me because it had. I didn't like USY, I didn't like the culture, I didn't like the kids, and this had a group, I remember I was keeping a journal at the time, and I remember I came home from my first Habonim meeting and wrote, I really fit here. So it was kids who had a kind of political seriousness to them, maybe a greater intellectual seriousness to them, I don't really remember, but they had they felt they were part of a movement and they were idealistic, they were socialists, they were going to live on kibbutz. Um, and it, did that appeal to you at that point? It did, it did. And um, they also had, for summer camp, they had an excellent curriculum that came out of the World Zionist Organization. Or maybe, maybe the Ichud Ha... Well, anyway, or maybe the Israeli Mapai Organization, I can't remember. But in any case, as I think I wrote, we had um, one summer, I was there for th all three summers of the curriculum because it rotated from um, Jewish history, Zionist history, and socialist history. So I read a lot of stuff. This is when I was in high school. I read a lot of stuff from, uh, you know, from the, I read all of the Zionist idea by Arthur Hertzberg during that, as, as when I was in high school. Um, I learned a lot of history and I also knew a lot of history because I had been interested in it. I had absorbed what I had gotten in Hebrew school, I think, unlike the Dorothy Pesson books, unlike most of my confrere. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I remember reading socialism and all this kind of stuff. So I learned a great deal. Um, there was not as much Hebrew there, but every day we learned a new Israeli song, a new Israeli dance. Uh, there were more Israelis at the camp, and also being exposed to the Baltimore kids was an important influence on me because they were second generation kids. The Washington kids were all third generation kids. So they had immigrant parents who had come after the Holocaust, many of whom had been active in Zionist movements in Europe, um, and for whom it was a kind of living tradition. And uh, and they were, uh, you know, I, I went up we would have a third Seder every year, a joint one, with the with the kids from Baltimore. And I remember going up, staying with my friend Trudy Litt, whose parents were European, and seeing a different world. Friday night during Pesach, all of her aunts and uncles were there around the table. Every man made Kiddush on his own wine and little chalot, um, not little matzahs, obviously, it was Pesach, on matzahs. Um, the food was different. Um, uh, the more the sort of uh, uh, decorum was different. Trudy would not let me help clear tables, even when she and I were the only ones in the house. She said my mother would kill me if she knew I let a guest help. Oh, interesting. 
Yeah, so it was fascinating to me, you know, and I also stayed with another friend, Rochelle, whose family lived over the store. You know, it was a different world class-wise. People had accents. And I don't remember if I mentioned this before or not, but another really big influence on me was the exhibit on the Lower East Side, Portal to America, or Gateway to America, which showed at the Smithsonian that sometime, I guess, after I graduated from college. Um, so that was when? 60s? I graduated from college in 67. Um, I know because I spent my junior year in Israel, again, a very big influence on me. I, boy, I'm, I'm, <laughs> in college, I became Orthodox. Uh, Go back and just talk yes. a minute about how you decided to go to Brandeis. Which how did I go to decide to go to Brandeis? I didn't get into Radcliffe or Swarthmore. That's that's how I decided the to go to Brandeis. Of life, yes. Yeah, um, I was crushed not getting into Radcliffe or Swarthmore. My my uh, my father was crushed. Um, so I went to Brandeis. I was very happy at Brandeis. Um, and um, and you said you became an Orthodox in practice then. Yeah, I mean, it was easy to do. Uh, first of all, I did sign up for the kosher cafeteria line. And I, since I had this idea of authentic davening already from my youth, that's where I was likely to find it, was with the Orthodox kids for the high holidays. And then um, you could sign up to eat in the sukkah, which I already loved Sukkot. And who signed up to eat in the sukkah? The Orthodox kids. So they were a chevra. They took me in. I mean, I'd say that a theme of my life for many years was always being part of a, a powerful Jewish community, whatever it was. I was in Habonim in high school. I was Orthodox in college. Then, you know, uh, after floundering around for two years after college, I found Fabrengen. I was in the Chavara movement for many years. And then wherever I went, I was part of, you know, I was part of a Chavara style minion. So that the theme of being part of a community was very important. A Jewish community was always very important to me and perhaps more important being part of it than exactly what the details were. Um, I know that it made my freshman year at Brandeis much easier than most freshmen because I had friends across all the classes because I was in the Orthodox Chavra. Right. And what did you major in there? Near Eastern and Judaic Studies. Was that just a given? That that... No, I flirted with physics for a while. Um, but uh, I, I didn't really have the preparation for physics. I had not been great at math in college, in high school. My mother said when I decided not to take calculus my senior year of high school, she said, thank God, I won't have to get you through that too. So I don't think I was really suited for physics, although there was a charismatic physics professor that I thought was wonderful. Um, and I thought about it for a while. But uh, I... Um, uh, I came in intending to do Near Eastern and Judaic Studies, and I did it. Uh, I was interested. I took courses mainly in philosophy, Jewish philosophy, and Kabbalah. That was that was my interest. In high school, I had also had this little flirtation with the aesthetic intensity of Catholicism. I wanted to be able to kneel before God. I was fascinated by all those saints with the mystical experiences. Um, and I went looking for mystical experiences in Kabbalah, um, although the first day of class, my revered professor, Alexander Altman, Allah HaShalom, said, you know, we're doing the history of Jewish mysticism here. We're not doing no mystical experiences. And there was some piece of me that was very disappointed, but I immediately parroted the party line. Um, and... Um, so you said he was, Altman was a very strong influence. Like yes, he was. Yes, he was. So. Um, you did a thesis under him, among other things. Yes, I did. I, I, I did do a thesis under him. I, um, when you say of somebody he was my teacher, I guess I would say Altman was my teacher. Um... 
And as with other teachers, you have a complicated relationship. He had sort of expectations of me that I was not anxious to fulfill or I felt too tangled up in. I guess one thing you need to know about me is that I um, have always, since elementary school, been very bad at finishing assignments. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you, um, well, I don't know, I guess it can't matter anymore. Penn gave me a PhD when I still had six incompletes. They just filled in the grades. I'm not going to lose a job now because I've admitted that. I'm already retired. <laughs> um, so, I mean, and that was the case in elementary school, it was the case in high school. I had actually very mediocre grades in high school because I didn't finish things. Great board scores, which is what got me into Brandeis. Um, and uh, so I had trouble, you know, finishing the papers I needed to do. I mean, I, I went for classes with exams because I was very good at exams. But in my major, I couldn't do that. So, I mean, I was supposed to be doing uh, some complicated thesis for Altman, and then he finally said to me, um, look, here's a manuscript, translate and annotate it, a medieval manuscript. So I did. That was a kind of finite task I could do. Um, but what did you, would you say you took away? I mean, he was your teacher, as you said. So I guess what I took from him, although, you know, I also, I mean, I also said to him once, some years later, someone can be someone's teacher without being, you can be someone's student without being their disciple. Um, because he was somebody who loved philosophy, and I didn't love philosophy. He felt philosophy purified the mind. I mean, he was an old German Jewish scholar. I was there for Kabbalah, and he only taught it, he didn't teach it in the way I really wanted it to be taught, but I learned a great deal from him. I studied Midrash with him, I studied Kabbalah with him, I studied medieval philosophy. Um, I did my text study with him, and he wanted me to go on and get a PhD. You know, part of the thing was that what did you do in 1967 when you wanted to become a Jewish study scholar? The next thing after getting your BA was to go to the JTS for five years and do the scholarly track in the rabbinical school. But as they say, in those days I couldn't pass the physical. <laughs> so the question was, what was I supposed to do? And I guess he thought I should do a PhD in Israel, which I did not do. Although I had that was his solution to this problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I didn't do anything for a while. Um, but I went to. I did do my junior year in Israel where I studied Kabbalah and philosophy and other things. And who did you study with there? Uh, Yosef ben Shlomo studied Cordovero, I think, with him. I studied with Eli Shvaid, uh, Shmona Prakim la Rambam. I studied with Shlomo Pines. On the, I mean, if you could say you study with him, he walks in, he looks out the window, he says, Uvachain. And I mean, I took all my classes in Hebrew. Um, unlike most of my other American friends who took the English classes. And he just continues in mid-sentence wherever he left off at the end of the last uh, Rivka Schatz. Those were my main teachers there. Um, but I didn't keep up with any of them. But I learned, again, a lot of text. Uh, I studied Zohar with Rivka Schatz. Cordovero, I guess, with Yosef Blin Shlomo, uh, Rambam with Schweid, and sort of a history of Jewish philosophy, I think, with Pines. Um, and, uh, and I stopped being Orthodox partway through the year. Israeli Orthodoxy, I guess, was just too much for me. Um, and uh, I had an Israeli roommate. I began to, well, I don't know. Um, I'll leave that out. Uh, and uh, being in Israel was very powerful for me. I was intent with the Habonim background on becoming an Israeli. And I also thought that um, I also thought that the fact that I was miserably unhappy 
wasn't because I was an unhappy teenager who didn't get along with my parents and all that stuff, but because I was a Jew in exile. I had internalized the Zionist ideology I learned at Habunim, and I thought that once I got to Israel, all my problems would be gone. I would be a Jew at home. And of course, they just got worse. Um, and uh, I had a shattering year, my junior year of Israel. I was in complete emotional wreck by the end of it because I was trying to make myself into an Israeli. I, you know, I had a pretty good imitation going. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I could fool a lot of people. You know, I remember Ben Shlomo when I came to get something signed by him at the end of the year, you know, said I was a, you know, Pharisees, Ma, the Merikite? Um, uh, so, uh, but, and I had this whole ideology going that I was coming back, you know. A year later, I was going to make Aliyah, but I didn't do it, and deep in my heart, I didn't want to do it. I wasn't happy there. I didn't feel at home there. Um, Did you have that sense of community, or is that part of what was really lacking for you there? Uh... That you mentioned a little while ago. Yeah, I don't think I did. And I, um, I, uh, well, I had, I was very close friends with my Israeli roommate. I, I made friends with her family. I did not hang out with the American kids who mostly hung out with each other because I was going to become an Israeli. I spoke nothing but Hebrew the whole time I was there. Um, so, you know, I was dreaming in Hebrew. But I remember when my roommate from Brandeis, who didn't speak Hebrew, came to visit me, I exploded into puns because I couldn't make puns in Hebrew. <laughs> um, I think I once did, and I was so proud of myself. But, you know, that was a level of Hebrew that was beyond me. And I did not go back to Israel for a long time. Um, this was 65, 66 that I was there. So it was before 67. The year before. Yeah, and it was, actually, the Six-Day War was during my senior week at Brandeis. But um, my, uh, so that, I did in some ways love that pre-67 Israel, the more modest Israel, the Israel uh, before the conquest, the Israel where there was no TV, when most people didn't have cars, when most people were cooking on, you know, two burners in the kitchen, um, you know, I and doing their laundry in the bathtub. Um, so do you, it's just afternoon, do you want to Yeah, break, I think probably should break? bake and see if I can track Nancy down. Okay. You were saying that after college you spent a couple of years mm -hmm. sort of betwixt and between, it sounds like. Right. But then decided to go to library school. Yeah, I, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to be. I kept waiting for the light to dawn that said you were going to be a, didn't dawn, I said I better learn a trade. So um, I uh, I went to library school. Uh, I had been in doing New York? In, at Columbia, mm -hmm. which has abolished its library school. The very first library school in the nation, founded by Melville Dewey himself. Oh, but in any case, uh, I went to Columbia University Library School, sixty nine seventy, and um, before I went up there, talking about the sixties, at some family party, I had a. I saw one of the New York cousins who was a New York City policeman. He said, Columbia, eh? If they send me up there one more time, they're going to have to give me a diploma, because this was the era of the protests. And indeed, I wondered about meeting my cousin Ernie across the barricades. And in the spring of my year uh, at Columbia in uh, uh, 70, the spring of 69, 70, was I there? Or, yeah, I think I was there, 69, 70, um, Kent State. And there was massive demonstrations which closed down Columbia. And we as librarians decided that what we needed to do was collect ephemera. We went around collecting posters, handouts, flyers, all this kind of stuff um, to document it. I guess one of the ways I've continued to think about, about documenting, um, uh, you know, Anyway, uh, so... Uh, this was a time of tremendous ferment, obviously. Yes, it was. It yeah. was. I was not very political. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I went to the big demonstrations. I, um, I remember feeling disoriented, as we all did during those days. I remember in the middle of the night making myself a bowl of soup because soup was comforting. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, you know, uh, uh, I think I had the general sentiments of, of young people of my era, but I didn't, and as I think I wrote also, I wore the uniform, you know, the Indian print dresses, the boots, the whatever else, but I didn't, um, I was not active in a lot of political stuff. Um, I was still searching for Jewish stuff. I lived a few blocks from the Jewish Theological Seminary. While I was in library school, I worked in the Jewish Theological Seminary library part-time uh, and uh, acquiring books, Judaica, that is not Hebraica, but Judaica. And Dr. Schmelzer said, tell your Altman student um, by what I bought, what I thought was important for a Jewish studies library. And... Um, uh, and I occasionally davened at the JTS Minion, but I was not doing anything very Jewish, although I was friends at that time already with the Moshewitzes. I don't know if you're interviewing them at all. Uh, Deborah, Deborah and Solomon Moshewitz. I had known Deborah from Brandeis. And um, they were the founders of, um, oh God, I can't even remember what it's called, the alternative to Minyan Me'at in uh, at Anshe Chesed, the more popular one. Um, that was later. later. But they were very active in the Chavara movement. They were part of Beit Chavara. I don't know if you're trying to get any of those people. The New York Chavara. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was a little later, but... but um, uh, so they hadn't really started their things yet, but uh, and I don't think while I was there I knew about the New York Chavara. I only found out about it, or maybe my parents sent me a clipping about it while I was still in New York. Can't remember. Um, what about the general American sort of youth counterculture? It's music. It's well, you know, drug, it's, sex, and rock and roll. Well, I never did any drugs ever, um, except I tried smoking hash once and nothing happened. <laughs> uh, so I, I mean, I had a lot of friends who did some drugs. Yeah. Um, I did have uh, a certain amount of sex. Um, uh, I liked the music. Uh, I liked the sense, I mean, I, I participated in the general sense that we were a generation that was really going to change things and that the problems of the world could be solved which, alas, now that I'm older, I'm glad there are younger people who think that. But anyway, that, that we could solve racism and sexism. And um, I mostly did it, to the extent I did that stuff, I did it through Jewish avenues. Um, Were you caught up in the anti-war? I, I went to some demonstrations, you know. Um, I, I wasn't... I wasn't uh, a planning activist in any of those things. I, you know fellow traveler, I don't know. I, I, I went to the things that people went to. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, hated LBJ, even though I now have greatly revised my opinion of him um, and uh, wish we had not turned him out of office. Um, but anyway, um, no, I, I, I chanted, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today in front of the White House? You know, but I didn't organize any of these things. Uh, I went sometimes. So let's turn now and focus yes. on um, the period in which you became involved with the Brooklyn. Yeah. So, yeah, I, ha I got a job at the Library of Congress. JTS wanted to keep me, but they couldn't match the salary. Um, and I think I was probably happy to be going back to Washington where I had grown up. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me a sense of what your sort of overall sense of self was, and particularly your, your sense of yourself Jewishly at that point? You've been through a lot of different That's right. At that point. That's right. And I was, I probably spent the year in New York, 69, 70, and the, the first six months I was in Washington in the fall of 1970, um, searching for some uh, satisfying Jewish alternative. I didn't really go to shul very often. I'm, I'm somebody who is a constant Shabbos shul goer, and I have been for most of my life. Um, 
uh, and um, I had gone in college, um, and I um, anyway. So during during I did not go. I don't think very often when I those two years of interim. But anyway, when I came back, I mean, I in New York, as I say, occasionally went to Davin at JTS, um, and there was nothing else I knew about actually. Um, that there weren't a lot of alternatives, and I had mixed feelings about JTS and about whatever. It wasn't a community for me. Um, I came back to DC, and I also looked for a community. I the place I went was sort of like the hip Orthodox shul at Twenty Eighth and N in Georgetown. That you know, what's his name Lieberman belongs to now, and all that stuff. But I didn't. It was not. It wasn't. It was at a rather low point when I went. And um, it also didn't quite pull me in because I had been Orthodox, you know. But uh, it was only when I heard about Fabrengen that I, you know, uh, I went to the second meeting, which was in February of 1971. February of So just yeah. when you were coming back to Washington. Yeah, I had been there for a number of months. I was living in my own apartment. During the interim years, I had lived with my parents out in the suburbs. Right. And um, I uh, don't recall how I heard about Fabrengen. So this was the period that yeah. uh, this group of young people from That's right. Jews for Urban Justice, That's J&J, right. were exploring That's the right. notion of yes. starting some kind of a new... Yes, community. holistic Judaism was the holistic Judaism. Yes, and Chavar- spelt with a W. With a W, exactly. <laughs> Chavarot Shalom had been established in sixty-eight. Yes. The New York Chavarot yeah. in sixty-nine. About which I was more or less ignorant at that time, but other people were not necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, and then there was also, I mean, David Schneier came in from a Karl Bach trip, sort of. I mean, he was influenced by Karl Bach. Uh, so it's not just the Chavara movement that was playing into all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the different movements were less, I think, clearly distinguished in those days. Um, so what do you remember about that that time that the idea was sort of starting to take shape for a new community? Well, I guess, first of all, I remember that, you know, I was in both JUJ, Jews for Urban Justice, and also in Fabrengen, that the membership between the two of them in the early days was quite similar, quite over, quite a heavy overlap. I don't remember any more of the early activities, which were which. But do you remember, just to even the idea, a little bit, like, do you, did you see this concept paper in your Jewish community that was being circulated? I, no, in the I didn't. I don't, I don't recall that I did. Okay. Let me put it that way. What I do know is, and the way I thought about it was, we were funded by the Jewish community. The Jew, the um, we didn't have a federation; it was the the UJA. UJA. Um, uh, they put us in a house in Dupont Circle. They chose the. Spe- the I think so, or maybe we chose it and they paid for it. And their view was that I mean, why Dupont Circle? Because that's where the Jewish hippies were. And they saw us as people who would get the Jewish hippies to throw away their needles and start dancing the Hora. This is their idea of what our function was. This is why they funded us. They wanted us to take those, um, in their eyes, probably dangerous Jews, the ones who were disaffected, who were doing drugs, who were, who were into the counterculture, and give them an attractive Jewish alternative. And DuPont Circle was just the place where they were hanging out? Well, that was like the center of the counterculture in Washington at the time. Okay. And um, so... So they gave you, they gave $15,000 a grant yeah. for six months. Yeah, right. And they took it away. After the six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you... they held a show trial. Do you have a sense of what the Washington sort of D.C. Jewish scene was at that point, and and the relationships between Jews for Urban Justice, for this brand new for Brennan, and its relationship to the Jewish establishment? So, 
of course, I had grown up in Washington, D.C., which not everybody, not most people in Fabrengen had. So I had a long history. I knew people in a lot of different synagogues. I knew people who were in the Jewish establishment. I used to call them sometimes when I felt we were being persecuted. Um, uh, Harvey Ammerman, who was a neurosurgeon, who had been our across-the-street neighbor. Um, I think that... Uh, the Jewish establishment was very unhappy with our political stances. Um, I guess it was J.U.J. who did the notorious, this is the bus, bus to Auschwitz caper. Have you heard about that? Okay. They built a new JCC, which is the main JCC now. It's out in Rockville, Maryland, in the suburbs. And they had uh, a bus, buses going. I was not there at this event. They had buses going from the downtown JCC on, on, on 16th Street to, um, to take the community out from there to the new JCC. And some of people in JUJ, because they were criticizing Jewish slumlords, held up posters that said, this is the bus to Auschwitz, meaning, yeah, <laughs> uh, meaning you horrible people, you're just like the Nazis as, a, as slumlords. Um, we did other things. We like stood in front of Addis Israel on Tisha B'Av um, with people. Actually, people at Addis Israel thought it was just part of the Tisha B'Av observance. It turns out people stood holding candles at the main entrance, which was also meant to protest something. Um, <laughs> uh, and there were anti-Israel. The, well, so. Kinds of there, so I do remember at one of the big demonstrations, well, I mean, there were, there, there were activities construed as anti-Israel, as you know the difference. Um, there was, uh, you know, I remember that JUJ identified as a non-Zionist organization. Uh, what do they mean by that? Since they I don't there. really remember. I really am not good. I'm, I am apologetic. I don't remember all this stuff. But anyway, I do remember that as we were at some big demonstration, people from the Radical Zionist Alliance, the RZA, approached us like, oh, our friends, and the JUJ people turned away. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that that was a universally held view in Fabrengen. I think there were a variety of feelings about Israel in the group. Um, in Fabringen, um, and uh, I myself had had that horrible junior year, which did not necessarily make me an anti-Zionist. In fact, I think at that point I still hewed to a lot of the Zionist narrative. Um, but... Um, uh, There were a number of people there who had spent a fair amount of time in Israel. I was dating a guy who went to spend a year on a kibbutz while I was there. Um, you know, so it was critical, but not nearly as critical as people are nowadays. Um, and the, the UJA grant yeah. for, for, for bringing in sounds like it came with some strings attached. Oh, absolutely. Also, do you remember? No, I don't know. I don't know if it was strings that were written in or simply what they expected. For instance, I, I remember reading that um, part of the agreement was that J.J. could have no meetings half a break in. Ah. That's one. Another, okay. that yes. um, Sharon Rose and Mike Tabor could yes. not have any leadership roles. Right, 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 right. Those are the kinds of things I'm thinking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I guess I did not remember that, although I, it certainly sounds familiar. So, in fact, J.U.J. met in people's houses. So did those, do you, do you have memories of that causing tensions within I would say J.U.J. That, and for Brendan? Uh, well, I, what I'd say is that Sharon Rose went on to other things pretty fast. And Mike Tabor moved out to the country to raise sheep. And J.U.J., in fact, was disbanded in the summer yeah. of 71. Yeah, right. Shortly right. after right. Brendan was right. actually found. That's right, that's right. So, um, yeah, I guess the energy really shifted to this more spiritual, somewhat less overtly political or 
political in somewhat different directions. I remember Sharon, I didn't think Sharon was a very effective organizer. She tried to get a bunch of us stirred up over something um, and she, she called us over to her house and look at this terrible cartoon and off our backs and isn't this anti-Semitic or racist or something? And we said, no, not really. And she said, hmm. Well, they told me, you know, when they were telling me how to organize people that I should get them all stirred up about something. <laughs> You started to say yeah. there was some kind of rather incendiary meeting. Of... There was a, you know, at the when they when they were trying to decide whether to renew our grant. UJA, actually, yeah. the UJA. I don't know if you know um, or know of the Fenevesis. Charlie Fenevesi, He wrote for various papers. Wrote a book about a memoir of his Jewish childhood in Hungary. And uh, anyway, they were early members. Uh, he wrote for whatever the name of the B'nai B'rith Monthly was. He might have been its editor at that time, and he wrote a scathing article about this, how it was like communist show trials in the middle of the night, and they were interrogating us about, you know, how many feet Sharon Rose had walked into the circle or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean... As they were trying to determine whether they were going to renew the grant. Yes, that's right. This is what this was about. Yeah, that was, you know, it was about... Sharon, it was about the Zionism, it was about the slum lords, it was about all that stuff. So, um, so what happened? They didn't renew the grant. And we rented space someplace else, I don't know with what money. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> I just wanted to ask before we totally move on to yeah. the sort of beginning of sort of Ferengi yeah, in, right. in this post for a six month mm -hmm. period, whether there were feelings within Ferengi that that you remember as all of this was unfolding and what impact was all this having on the community? Well, you mean about about the controversy? Yeah. The controversy well I think I think we were outraged. Like the establishment. I think we were we were outraged at the establishment. This was part of the sixties though, although it was the seventies. I mean it was our job to be outraged at the establishment. <laughs> Um, it was their it was their job to be upset with us. I mean, there were all kinds of things. I mean, again, I don't even this was a little later, but I uh, there was something called the Sunday morning lecture series at Washington Hebrew, which was the biggest, oldest Reform congregation. Um, and they actually, at some point during my time at Fabringen, invited me to speak. I mean, there were riots. Riots because you were speaking among the audience. Why? My parents had a screaming fight with their friends on the steps. Why? Because uh, Fabrengen was considered to be so outrageous. Uh, my parents had fights on the steps of Addis Israel. My mother, I think, famously said, I'm just trying to find a way for her to meet somebody to marry. You know? <laughs> um, you know, so my parents defended it, but it was seen as... Um, a really, um, uh, you know, a really dangerous organization by a lot of people in the Jewish establishment, and we were upset. You know, I had worked at the Israeli embassy for a year before I went to library school, 69, 70. And then, actually, we invited Yossi ben Aharon, whom I knew from my work at the embassy, to speak at Fabrengen about Israeli issues. He refused to say hello and acknowledge me. Showed, um the Israeli ambassador, or one of the high embassy officials, the Israeli amb embassy was very opposed to us. It was right there in Washington. Sheldon Cohen was one of the uh, leaders of the Jewish community, and he told the story about how, uh, and my, he was a friend of my parents, you know, he said, you know, the Israeli ambassador said, uh, you know, don't support for bringing their very bad organization. So there's pressure from the Israeli embassy, too, to, uh, to oppose us. I want to go back to just the sort of the very beginnings also. So, um, as the as the community was being established, how did the name Fabrengen and Fabrengen? Uh, Rob Vegas picked Jewish it. Jewish Free Culture. Center. Was it Jewish Free Culture Center? God, Fabrengen I didn't even Jewish remember. Jewish Free Culture Center. Uh, well, it's now I guess it's been for a long time a Fabrengen community, I think. But in any case, Rob Vegas picked Fabrengen, and he didn't know any Yiddish, so he didn't know it was Fabrengen. And uh, he named it after the meeting of Hasidim with the Rebbe. That's what a Fabrengen is in Hasidism. 
Maybe only in Lubavitch Hasidism. I don't really, I should know the answer to that um, from a scholarly point of view. But in any case, I guess he had been to some Hasidic gatherings and he found them so inspiring. And of course, Hasidism was one of the inspiring uh, roots for the movement that it was named after this joyous coming together of people in a Hasidic community. To what extent, if at all, would you say that um, the founders of Hebrain had Harat Shalom and the New York Hobara in mind as they were developing the idea? And, and was the, the, the fact that they didn't, that the word Hobara was not included deliberate or not in the name? Uh, I can't answer. I'm sorry. Ask Rob. Um, uh, I, um, I know that we pretty soon found out, well, you know, the Jewish catalog was important. Right, it came out in 73. Yeah. So, I mean, and we began having, you know, the inter retreats and all that, which was, um, built the sense of a movement. Uh, did Rob know about, did Arthur, I don't know if Arthur knew, but Rob, David Schneier, did they know about these other movements? I just don't even know. Mm -hmm. Certainly when Max came, he knew about them. Right. Uh, so what was the vision for this community? For well, this community? so, I mean, I, I, what, in fact, I just read my deathless prose about this, which I wrote for several flyers, which was in that notebook. Uh -huh. um, uh, holistic was Rob's word, it was a big word, um, you know, that it would be a whole way of life. Um, that it would enable us to live our Judaism in the present, that um, it was egalitarian, and this was in some ways really different from Chavarat Shalom, especially. It was, uh, from the get-go, egalitarian for women and men. It was a basic principle. In fact, when we met the Chavarat Shalom people, we were shocked at how male it was. Um, and um, I'll stick that over there. Uh, so, um, so gender egalitarianism, uh, you know, I would say that the community was very different when we had the house and then afterwards. In the house, what we had House was the first six place. months. Yeah, six months. Okay. Uh, what you had then was the main activity was Friday night. There was a potluck dinner. There was ecstatic dancing, and we brought in bands actually uh, to '60s music, not Jewish music. I remember somebody playing all along the Watchtower. Um, you know, and, and people would dance, and then we would have a potluck supper, there'd be more dancing, and for the very few people who wanted it, there would be some kind of mariv davening. That was what Rob was into. Rob was very into davening. Um, and we, I, you know, I'm not sure in the house we did much on Shabbos morning at all. Maybe a little, you know, and we certainly did evolve those. Uh, what, what our Shabbos morning was mainly about for a long time was simply, as you've probably already heard, Reading the parsha aloud in English and stopping to discuss it whenever no, we had no, anything I want to, come to discuss. Yes, shortly. Yeah, right. Really focus on that. Yeah, but but so so the thing is, it was those those evening meetings which were the heart of Fabrengen and also classes. We had classes there. I taught, uh, I taught Hebrew. I think can't remember exactly what else. We had classes in Hebrew in Sidur in uh, Talmud, um, Yiddish when Max came. Who was the target audience? Who, who was Fabrengen trying to reach? And I, I want to just, uh, as we were sort of mentioning Chavarot Shalom, mm -hmm. remind you that Chavarot Shalom and the Nehra Chavarot were membership organizations. That's right, and we, we were very flag. proudly not membership okay, organization. So tell me about we were that. egalitarian in a number of ways. And unlike either Chavarot Shalom, which was a rabbinical seminary to begin with, or the New York cover. I mean, my mother sent me some flaw, some newspaper article about the New York cover. At some point, I said I'd never qualify to get in, and I was a Jewish studies major. You know, I probably would have qualified to get in, but um, you know, they were looking for people who were in graduate school about Judaism or rabbinical. Anyway, we were. Um, you know, I don't, see, I'm sorry, I just don't remember a lot of this stuff. I don't remember how we targeted anybody, although we did, I mean, one of the flyers I wrote um, 
was, uh, uh, which I read, was like we had free high holiday services. So, but the point, as I understand yeah. what you're saying, and what I've read, is that it was very diverse in terms of That's right. the people you were trying to attract. You were we, looking for people with a particularly no, and a lot of people background. No, a lot of we attracted a small number of non-Jews, some of whom converted to Judaism. Um, for a while, we attracted the new congressman Henry Waxman with his young family, but they didn't stay. Um, we had at least one African American long-standing member. Um, we attracted uh, a very wide group of people, some of whom knew stuff about Judaism and some of whom knew almost nothing. Right. And that was fine with us. Um, the way you become a member, as I wrote in this little pamphlet, is by coming to activities. And was there a membership in any uh, other sense? That later. Later, but not during this first period. No. So there were no dues or anything no, like that? No, no, no. Later there were dues. Later there was even a coordinator, but that was after my time. So a paid coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was after 75, I think. Mm -hmm. So you said in your pre-interview yeah. questionnaire that for Bringen immediately became your place to, yes. to be and do Jewish. So That's right. What was drawing you in at this point? You've been searching. Yes, I had been. I, I, I um, think I probably liked several things about it. I liked the people, um, the diverse group of people. I liked, uh, you know, it was the 60s, I was in my 20s. I liked the ecstatic dancing. That was the 70s, but it was the 60s. The I was 60s. In, yes, right. Late, I, liked the, I liked the dancing. I liked the, eff the, you know, as Durkheim would say, the effervescence. Um, I liked, really loved the sense that we were creating a new form of Judaism that was, in our eyes, better than what we had grown up with. And most of us who had Jewish backgrounds had grown up with formal conservative or reform synagogues where people were wearing robes and, were, and the congregation was a passive audience. So the idea of shaping it ourselves to our own needs, out of our own encounter with tradition, was profoundly attractive. And the fact that, you know, it was, uh, for me, gender egalitarian, that it was, um, it was a chance to um, participate in a very active way um, was very attractive, too. I mean, and it was a community. I've told you about the importance of community. We had Shabbos dinners in each other's homes. We did a lot of stuff together besides formal meetings, you know, go hiking or canoeing or something. Um, we, um, you know, early, pretty f quickly there was a women's group formed, which had a lot of the, um, probably in 72 or 73, there was a women's group formed that had a lot of the energy of the community in it. And then there was another women's group formed afterwards. Um, early on, do you have the sense that it was pretty equally divided between men and women, or, or, or did men or men predominate? Uh, you mean in leadership roles? No, I just mean in, in, in the In community. numbers? No, probably women predominated. Mm -hmm. we were, it's the way we were different from the other groups. Yeah, yeah. there were no women in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, right. The Cop, yeah right. No, I, I would say there were more women than men in, in the membership, although more men than women in leadership roles to begin with. It took me a couple of years before I got my uh, courage up to lead davening. And by then we were having a davening, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and I learned during my final year there, I learned to read Torah, although there were other women who were reading Torah, and I trained people to read Haftorah, which I knew how to do from Hebrew school. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so tell me about what kinds of activities were going on um, in general. That, so besides the services, uh, so, I mean, Friday night dinners. And yes, and then, and then gradually it became more people had Friday night dinners in their own homes. So there was also Shabbos dinners after, after Shabbos, you know, Shabbos lunch after davening the people had in each other's homes. So um, sometimes we would have Havdalah together. Um, we also had retreats. Um, I remember one in particular. I can't remember where we had these things. Um, but I remember one guy was involved in the planning of the food <laughs> and it was, um, it was a, a, a retreat to study Sephardic culture. 
and someone so, came up with that as a theme. Yeah, we, I don't know. We, in the course of discussion, we decided it would be a good thing to do over this to study the history of Sephardic Jews and their culture, and you know, and you know, I remember doing a fair amount of research. I was working at the Library of Congress, of course, in the with the Hebrew books. So it was I had the greatest library in the world open to me. Um, uh, to do research, I, I did this. I read this book on comparative halacha between Sephardim and Ashkenazim. I can't remember. It began some guy whose name begins with a Z. Can't remember. Um, and uh, and I researched food. I used Claudia Rodin's one of my favorite cookbooks, Middle Eastern Cooking. Everybody said the food was the best we'd ever had on a retreat. Um, and you know, we had various sessions and we also tried to make it look as we thought Sephardic. I think we had carpets spread out on the floor and cushions or something. Although again, in those days when we davened, we davened in a circle on the floor, sitting on the floor on cushions or whatever. So that wasn't unusual. That wasn't unusual, but it was, the, it was the decor that was more. Yeah. And we had drape, draperies and stuff like that. Um, we also attracted people who, um, you could say had talents in the dance area. Several people who were sign language interpreters who are also um, very much sort of, they're very physical people, at least that's what I've noticed. Um, we had here again, I don't remember the year, but it was, it was, it was very interesting. A woman, I don't remember her name. She was from Casper, Wyoming, and she was originally not Jewish. I don't remember if she converted. But in any case, she decided to have a Saturday night dinner and invite people. That is, instead of a Shabbos dinner. Um, and it was fun. I mean, she had hors d'oeuvres, and she had all these kinds of things you would have in a fancy dinner party, which we didn't do for Shabbos. We did other kinds of things for Shabbos. So we were all dressed up. We, it was it was it was like the I mean it, it, nobody I mean everybody was enjoying it and sort of having a little giggle at it but it was really like the anti Shabbat dinner. Um, Did she intend it that way or was it? I, I don't really know. Way? I think I think it was just that she said maybe she grew up with it. You know who knows. In any case, although some of us grew up with them too, but she said I just I wanted to do this for a change. And Have it was people? Fun. Yes, it was fun. Um, and, uh... You said it was different from how you would do Shabbat dinners. Right. So, tell us about those. What, these were, these would take place in people's homes, or are yes. you talking about a potluck? Yeah, well, but... we would have, we would have some of each, and I don't remember the era when we stopped having the main potluck dinner at Fr for Brangen on Friday nights. I don't remember when that was. Um... Maybe we always had it. I don't really know. I can't remember. You know, it all runs together. Sure. Potluck dinner was dairy, um, and people just brought a bunch of casseroles. There would be wine and challah. There would be kiddush. Um, there would be candle lighting beforehand. I don't remember if there was, uh, what kind of benching there was. In people's homes, there would be, there would be, um, yeah, there was. By the time, I, I remember actually, Arlene Agus came to visit me, and it was already we knew the New York people I was living, and I remember having Shabbat dinner at home, and uh, and I don't think it was just because of her, um, but um, you know, it could either be milchik or fleshik. It had challah, it had wine, it had dessert. You know, people tried to, people did bring things to Shabbat, other people's houses for Shabbat dinner, um, which means that at least among the Shabbat dinner people, most of us kept kosher. Um, and at potluck dinners that took place after bringing in? Oh, it, it just had to be dairy. Dairy. So that was yeah. the or, sort of or a, parv, the consensus yeah. within the community. Yeah, that that's right. Well, we had discussions about it. We also talked a lot about the halachic process and how we would make decisions about these things. I remember more talk about the process than about the actual decisions. Um, uh, so... Was there singing at these... At these yes, there was. Um, I think people did sing some Zmirot at Shabbat dinner at home um, and Shabbat afternoon. 
but I can't swear to it. Um, but as I say, I think so. Uh, okay. I wanted to ask you about um, the role of sort of social action and explicitly mm -hmm. political yeah. activities because so many people had been members also of JUJ and right. come from a sort of politically left-leaning yeah. leaning environment. Yeah. So, um, I was not a very political person is one thing to say about me. Uh, and I know that, you know, the common parlance was that Chavarat Shalom was the spiritual Chavara, the New York Chavara was the intellectual Chavara, and we were the political Chavara. Um, but um, Arthur Wasco sent out enormous mailings every week. Now, of course, he can send them on email. Enormous mailings every week of all the articles he thought was, were important. Some people read them. I threw them out. Um, and I, I made him feel very bad when I said, I just don't have the energy for all that political shit. He said, it's not shit. Um, uh, so... Do you remember, uh, for instance, um, draft counseling that was done by... It, by Fabrengan? Uh, or counseling that was done for people? It just is an activity of the organization. In a word, I don't remember. Okay, that's fine. Um, how about the big uh, rally, the the um, anti-war and Vietnam War rally in D.C. that took place yes. in 71? Do you remember that one? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, and uh, I do remember that. I remember... Um, walking around DuPont Circle the night before and seeing the soldiers come in in tanks. Or maybe it wasn't tanks, but it was, you know, military vehicles. And I was with some of the people there and, you know, some of the people who said, all ready for tomorrow? And they said, yes, we are. The soldiers did. Um, and, uh, you know, that was kind of scary, seeing the soldiers coming in. I um, spent that day at a first aid station which might have been at Verbrengen. Um And um, I actually could have gotten in trouble for not being at work that day because the federal government, I was working for the Library of Congress, uh, had instructed everybody to be at work. Um, but I did stay out. And I, it's an act of political protest. That was. It was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, nothing happened to me as a result. But I guess because I had been doing something neutral like first aid, and was there any need for first aid? I don't recall. I don't recall. Yeah. Probably not much. Um, not where we were, anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you remember having guests from other Hubbard Road, from, from Boston and from New York, coming down for this at all? I don't remember. Okay. The political just wasn't the center of my life. Yeah, so I want to get to that yeah. part. Yeah. Um, so let's delve into some of the key components. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, community, which was obviously yeah. at the heart of the yeah. endeavor. Um, and uh, can I want you to just describe, try and sort of paint a picture for us of uh, what the community was like when Fabrengen first began in those in those early years. Who who were the kinds of people who were involved, and how many people are we talking about? Um, what kind of backgrounds did they bring? Well. Uh, let's see. So I know in those very early years, they were. I must have been um, 40, 50 people at the big potluck dinners with the dancing and just a couple of people in the mornings for Shabbos morning, whatever we did. Later, um, we would probably have, and again, this may run into 74, 75, because I just don't really remember. We would probably have 20 or 30 people on Shabbos morning. Um, for davening and Torah discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as I say, more women than men. Um, we had people who were Vietnam War veterans. I dated one of them for a number of years, and his roommate was also a Vietnam War veteran. Uh, nice Jewish boys were lawyers. Um, we had, um, we tended to have 
mostly people with some Jewish background and inclination, not only. Um, but people who might have gone to day school in elementary school or, um, I mean, again, maybe these were the people I was more friends with. Uh, not all of them. Some people were very political, so you should not leave that out. Just not me. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Rosalie Richmond, who was in for Brangen and then later was in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and you know, all this kind of stuff. People, people were. Um, and, uh, yeah, we had one person there who had been kicked out of the yeshiva of Flatbush when she was in 10th grade. Um, uh, but not many people with Orthodox backgrounds. In fact, she's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, although there were people who came through sort of later. Um, we had a lot of speakers. Adin Steinsaltz came to talk to us. Um, so, uh, we were seen as a, and he actually affected me very powerfully. Uh, I felt that, um, you know, I was a youth. I felt that after I listened to him and he talked about how his path to observance and how, how you know, he was brought up secular and then the first time he put on a kippah, he felt like it weighed tons and all this kind of stuff. I thought, um, God is calling me to do this. And I said, I don't want to be called. That's and how you responded? I don't want to be, I don't want to be Orthodox. I don't want to do it. I'd spent, and I felt God was calling me for about two weeks. And then I said, and I kept saying, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And finally, God stopped calling. Um, although, even though Steinsaltz had said that if he had answered God's call the first time, it would have been a lot easier for him. But I decided not to. And guess what? God has never called me to be Orthodox again. <laughs> so... Um, uh, but I guess I was somebody who I felt could be called by God to do some things. Um, and look, I mean, when I was in college, Kabbalah was what I was studying because I was looking for spiritual experience. And that is the heart of my Judaism. Um, that is the experience of davening. Um, the experience of being in relation to a deeper ground of being. And the Fabrengen was a place to do that. Um, a place where that kind of thing was taken very seriously, um, where, uh, um, you know, that was part of the deal. Trying to live in relationship to the tradition, not just halachically, but spiritually. What did it mean? What did, what did the Torah have to say to us? What did later writings have to say to us about, you know, how we should live our lives, about what the life meant, about how to structure our lives? Right. That's what I found in Judaism was, you know, uh, as, as Levi Strauss says, you know, symbols that are good to think with. Okay. So you were just mentioning the um, spiritual dimension. And yeah. Importance for you and right. the experience of davening. So I wanted to delve into this a little bit yes, more. Yes, right. Um, can you give us an overview of how Shabbat was observed? So you said that movement from Friday night potlucks to... Yeah. Uh, dinners and homes. Dinners and homes, and then the beginning of a sort of more yes, more robust community. Gathering. Shabbat morning, Shabbat yeah, morning. that's right. So what, what did that morning feel like, and what was, was so, the structure of what so happened? So it grew out of this long Torah discussion, where we simply, in the early days, went around reading the parsha and stopping in English. Or in English? English. Most sitting. So I'm, I'm just trying to paint this picture. We're You're sitting, sitting, we're sitting, we're sitting on the floor in a circle, um, and we are to passing, or we, I don't know. We all have copies of the Chumash. We are, or the Tanakh uh, in English, and we're reading it. And whenever anybody has somebody they want to, something they want to talk to, they stop and say, "It's not just the person who's reading. Anyone could say, hmm, And this is the the classical chavra locutions. I have problems with this. I have problems with this, you know. 
why, um, you know, why was Avraham in charge and not Sarah? I have problems with um, all these sacrifices. I have problems with the fact that you have legal slavery. I have problems with the sexism in this story. I have problems with the ethical implications of being charged to murder the Canaanites. Um, and, and what would happen when someone raised an issue like that? Well, I, I, we would, uh, it would be a matter for discussion, and um, we would never say, this is what many people who were not in Fabrengen or a similar organization could have said, the hell with this scripture, we don't want it. We had to do something other than that. I mean, we could say, we reject this pasuk, um, we reject it, but <coughs> the scripture as a whole, you know, I mean, we had Midrash, too, you know. What do you mean, we had Midrash? That is, we tried to understand um, the difficult parts by coming up with interpretations. Can I come up with any examples? All the years are all mixed up in my head. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think also later people gave Divrei Torah. But in the beginning, no, you're mm -hmm. saying. That's right. It was more this, just more organic discussion. Mm -hmm. that yeah. Like this. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and it went on for hours. We often didn't finish till three in the afternoon. Was it preceded by davening, or I don't remember when that came. I don't remember the sequence. Eventually, there was a whole structure of a service, even Musaf, because um, I remember. I think Musaf, because so I remember doing when the first time I led davening. I did a repetition of the Musaf Amida, as far as I can recall. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sure. Um, so, um, uh, I think we had Musaf, although it's, I don't remember when we, the Chavara movement in general rejected Musaf as uh, calling for the return of sacrifices and something we didn't want to do. Temple, and the rebuilding, of, yes, yeah. right. But in the early days, it was the return of sacrifices. You know, that was before anybody had the crazy idea to rebuild the temple on its current site. <coughs> we didn't think about that so much as just animal sacrifice. I mean, there were in those days already vegetarians. Quite a few of them. And um, uh, so gradually we did have... Um, a selected Psuke de Zimra. We also did have readings in English. That readings pe of? Whatever people, poetry, prose, things that people thought would be interesting. I remember Rob reading something from Annie Dillard. Hold on one second, I've got to change this back. Okay, you're trying to take a sip. Yeah, good time for my throat to over here. what made me read Annie Dillard. I loved it. Yeah. The first one, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. I love that one too. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember, I mean, obviously, it, well, I'll wait. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Okay, so obviously at a certain point, different people had responsibility, and we also started to read Torah eventually. Um, In the beginning, no, it was yes. just this reading. The that's right, the that's English. right. And then gradually we added davening and we added Torah reading, probably under the influence of the Tictons. Um, but... Uh, Who came in like 73? Yes, yeah, they came in the fall of 73. Um, so, 
Uh, yeah, I, I imagine that's how it happened, but I'm not certain. Rob always wanted to have more davening. He was the son of a conservative rabbi. He grew up liking, liking davening, liking chazanut, and he had a voice that had the characteristics of chazanut, but he couldn't carry a tune. So he had that kind of timbre, but he didn't have, but he couldn't carry a tune. Um, what about you? You had talked about, you talked about several times how you resonated to davening and you... Right, not chazanish. Uh, no, but, no, but yes. Oh, I did. I did, and I did was. You miss it, though. Yeah. I, I probably, yeah. You know, I mean, I was, I was, I was certainly among those who was happy to see it getting more and more adopted, mm -hmm. and um, and I did lead davening. Although I know it was after the Tictons came, because I remember Max remarking that I had thrown a little Yom Tov Nusach into my repetition of the Amida. Um, <clears throat> I was just trying to get through it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also remember early on David Schneer teaching about the Nusach for the different services. During the service or outside? Now, I think it was, it probably was in our class on the Sidur, but it might not have been. It wasn't during the service. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, and I remember it being in the house, so it was early on. Um, so he was talking about, uh, you know, and he sang a little bit of the Nusach, and then I realized, you know, what these different, I, I had never verbalized it to myself, what Friday night Nusach sounded like, what Yontif Nusach sounded like, Shacharit Nusach, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. obviously there were people who knew those things, and of course David had a nice voice, and he was very into, and again, this is a countercultural thing, what he called Jewgrass. It was Jewish bluegrass. So he would bring that in? Or oh, he had, he had a band. He had a band. Ah, ah. I think they played on Friday nights. They played for Happy, you know, in those early days. Alan Oreski, who were his other people? Anyway, um, he put out uh, tapes. Um, I, I probably still have some of them. Um, and, uh, you know, things like Rocky Mountain Shabbos and uh, stuff like that, which was uh, influenced by Karl Bach, influenced by bluegrass music, and had Jewish words. Um, Do you remember other kinds of sort of uh, influences that people brought in, whether music or poetry, or from where? Mm -hmm. um, that's one kind of thing I'm curious about, and the mm -hmm. other is um, other ways of sort of gaining access to spiritual experience, whether mm -hmm. through silence, through meditation, those kinds of There wasn't was much things. meditation in Fabringen that I can recall. There was in the Germantown Minion silence and meditation. It's possible that we did have silent Pazuke de Zimra sometimes, but I don't recall any meditation whatsoever. I could be wrong. Um, there were, you know, the sort of, there was a little modern dance, expressive dance. It, during the service? Yeah. How would that happen? Uh, I, I think it might have been just when somebody who was talented in that way was leading the service, she might do some. Um, that's what I recall. It wasn't that we all did it, but that this particular woman, who was also a sign language interpreter, did some of those kinds of things. Um, I should mention also Kfar Out. This is not an example. Uh, have you heard about Kfar Out no, yet? No. What is it? Kfar Out was um, David Schneer and George Johnson decided they would go out to the country and found a Jewish commune where we could all live holistically. They called it Kfar Out. And, um, and uh, I can't remember how long they lived there. Maybe for the summer. We all went out there. I remember the toilet got stuffed up. Um, you know, and then, of course, Mike Tabor did this in a much more real way, living in the country, but not as a commune. And Arthur also lived some of those times out in the, out in the sort of rural Maryland. Uh, in a particular place? Or was they each did their own thing? I think they each did their own thing. They weren't all living near each other. Well, Arthur and, and Mike Tabor were near each other. Um, Mike Tabor had a lot of the early archives of J.U.J. His house burned down, Arthur told me once, when I was trying to collect some stuff. Um, yeah. 
And Michael Mash said he had early archives in a box that he had tied to the top of his car. He's going down the shore. He was going to work on them, and the um, box blew off. So the archives are gone. Those are early archives. Yeah, I mean, so um, so there was also that movement typical of the times towards the rural commune, but not really very fully realized. But there was this idea that living out in the country and on the land and, you know, you could bake enormous loaves of challah. And we had, of course, some vegetarian cooking. Um, that was part of it. Uh, Any particular cookbooks? Uh, this was a woman. Happened, no, uh, no uh, Moosewood and uh, the vegetarian epicure were were like the cooking bibles at the Germantown Minion, but they weren't. But they, they, I don't think they were out at this point. This was a woman who was a vegetarian, and she just taught us. She was a member of the community. Um, nice. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, How about um, going back to the yeah, service? Yeah. Um, do you recall any sort of? experimental approaches around that focused on the breath or well okay so um words yeah uh not much um but this is something that arthur pointed out that i did always um which was when i was leading davening and i was holding the torah for the shema as you take out the torah he said, and I guess he followed this, that I would make contact, eye contact with everybody in the room before I said the Shema. That is binding the community in this affirmation. Um, so, and I don't remember when Arthur began to say, yeah, for God, but I don't think it was during the Fabringen era. Um, I don't think we were into that kind of stuff. Not yet. It wasn't Not yet. Happening yet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, by the time in '75 I got to the Germantown Minion, there were people doing Sufi dancing. There was meditation. There was, and maybe we did it at Weiss's farm too. I just don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, although it's not on the kind of, um, you know, uh, agenda I just saw in this notebook. Mm -hmm. um, did you do things like chant um, parts of the liturgy in English? Yes, we did do that. Okay. We did do that. Um, and I don't remember how and when we started to do that. Mm -hmm. um, how about Nigunim? Were they part of... Yeah, they definitely could be. Um, not, not, though, in the way I think they were in Chavarat Shalom. Mm -hmm. um, uh what way is that? Well, you know, I, my feeling is, and I could be wrong about this because I wasn't in Chavarat Shalom very often, um, and not till 74, I don't think. Um, but the idea of a nigun as a meditative kind of way to get you in the mood for spiritual experience, I don't think we did that kind of thing in Fabrengen. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think I was at all shocked by it. We did sing, just trying to think. We did come back from Weiss's farm and other places knowing Nigunim. Lo rav la lechem velo tsam ala mayim ki im lishmo wa et divrei Hashem. And we learned it from the Boston people. Um, uh, I don't remember, I mean, but we did, I mean, I remember, you know, using... I do think that for we didn't do a whole traditional Pesuke de Zimra. I'm sure we picked pieces out of it and sang them. Uh, we were interested in new rituals. Such as what? Uh, covenant ceremonies for girls. There weren't any. 
Meaning at birth, when they at were birth, born. yeah, right, at yeah. birth. Okay. I remember a whole big discussion about it um, at Weiss's farm among the all the East Coast Chavara people and a few people from other places. Um, and Did, were there children in the community very much at that point? No, and actually Arthur founded um, the the Cheder community, which was a school, and those people actually were pretty separate from Verbrengen although some of them started out in Verbrengen. Um, uh, so the kids tended to get siphoned off to this other community, which was a, a sort of a Hebrew school. They didn't uh, participate, those families didn't participate in these Shabbos? Not as much. Activities no, they did much. their own thing. Okay. The only kids I can remember are um, Jeff and Resna Hammer's kids as regular participants. Rachel and I forget what their daughter's name was. There's a younger daughter. Oh well. Um, uh, How old are Arthur's kids? So I guess they did come. Arthur's kids were about three and five when it started. Um, <clears throat> did they come on Shabbos morning? I don't know. I don't think Irene came on Shabbos morning. So what what brought? The idea of doing a covenantal ceremony. Well, uh, for just girls. egalitarianism, just our commitment to egalitarianism. It wasn't, oh, we've had a daughter. What should we do? It was, how do we make Judaism more egalitarian? So that was a subject. Yeah. For a conversation. Yeah. Well, I mean, and in fact, the whole thing. I mean, I remember the discussion at Weiss's farm. We were hung up for a long time on having to cut something. You cut and a guy. During this breach. So, yeah, that's right. Well, should we per pierce her ear? No, but that's like a slave. Should we cut a little incision over her heart? You know, I mean, um, who was it? Oh, yeah, and the most radical suggestion was from the Gendlers, who did have children, Everett and Mary Gendler. They said you should cut the hymen. Needless to say, none of these things happened. <laughs> um... But they said, a bris, a uh, circumcision, is an opening of the male organ, taking away its covering. Cutting the hymen is the equivalent. People didn't buy that. Yeah, well, they in, the same, they, they, in the sense that they didn't start doing it. Well, we bought it, but we none of us had little girls, and none of us were about to start doing these things. Um, so uh, these were somewhat theoretical. They sort of were general discussions. They, yeah, I mean, um, there were people there from Marblehead at that retreat who had kids, but um, uh, and the Tictons had kids, obviously, but. Um, you know, we wrote these things up, we talked about them, they might have been published in response. Um, you know, so... Uh, and But how to make Judaism egalitarian was really a concern for us anyway, and for Brengen, and I guess for the wider community in some ways as well. Um, Within for Brengen, mm -hmm. how had women participated uh, until that point, it's, it sounded from what you said that it was quite egalitarian from the, from the get-go. Women were counted in the minion from the get-go, and those women who had skills, which were a smaller percentage than the men, could lead Torah discussions, um, lead davening, read from the Torah when we started to do all those things, mm -hmm. teach classes. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember the first time you actually read Torah? Yeah, I do. I wrote a poem about it, um, which I probably ought to be able to retrieve for you. Um, but that is, I did read, learn by rote to read the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, and I did from that early on uh, from, from a friend who made a tape for me. Right. And of course, the Rosh Hashanah Trump is different, and I still read that sometime. But um, the uh, learning to actually read was uh, the spring of 75, I guess, and it was my Omer project for the year, for that year. And so people undertook things, you know, from Pesach to Shavuos, uh, I was going to learn to read Torah from my friend Rose Burstein, and I was going to read Torah on Shavuos at Sinai. 
Um, uh, Had other women read at that point? Yeah, Rose read all the time because she knew how to do it. Um, but it was, and I did Haftorah because I had learned that in Hebrew school, as I think I mentioned. Right. Uh, and I guess we did Haftorahs. We, when we read on a regular Shabbos, we read a very small amount of the Parsha. A couple of Aliyahs. Or an Aliyah divided into a couple of Aliyahs. So you learned how to read, I mean, out of Lane. So yes, like, that's right. I, uh, and, you know. During this period. How yes. did you learn? Uh, I, Rose and I sat and we worked on it. I mean, I already knew what trup was because I had learned that in Hebrew school from the Haftorah. Yeah. So it was a matter of learning the trup. I mean, the thing is, because I know Hebrew, reading Torah is not such a big deal for me. You know, to memorize the words is nothing. Because I, I understand Hebrew, I know Hebrew well, I know Biblical Hebrew, and once I know what the vocalization is, it's not hard to remember, except, except occasionally, you know, if there's something unusual. Uh, so in my case, it was learning the trup, um, which is a lot easier than having to learn the trup set to a bunch of nonsensical words. Right. right. So, um, and I'm, I'm not a particularly musical person. So I just said we worked on it, and she wanted to read the Ten Commandments on Shavuos, so we didn't I didn't learn that. I learned all the whole reading on Shavuos up to then. So what was it like for you? Do you remember doing it? Oh, I, I, yeah, I loved it. I loved it, and um, I mean, I wrote the poem about it much later. But also, it was a poem about my entitlement as a woman to... Um, to to claim authority to speak from the Torah. Um, and uh, I wrote it as a response to a poem by Merle Feld about being a woman at Sinai. So, was it published anywhere? A couple of places. It was published first in the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion, and then... Um, mine was republished in that anthology called And All the Women Followed Her, uh, which was about Miriam, because my poem was about Miriam, among other things. Huh. Yeah. And it probably was, you could probably find it on the internet. Hmm. Um, so, did you, and you continued reading yes. the story after that? Right, right. I have continued reading the rest of my life, although I don't do it very often now. I'm just too tired to read Torah and Shabbos, so I don't do it a lot. What about um, Bat Mitzvah? Had you had a Bat Mitzvah when you were growing no. up? Um, no. No, that was actually that was an important thing at Fabrang, and I had a Bat Mitzvah when I was 26, because uh, my shul did not have Bat Mitzvah um, when I was 13. The next year, a rabbi with daughters came, and they immediately started having bat mitzvah, but I didn't do it then. I was already 14. And so what I did was, I had a big, I did have a big party. I had a big service. I was all dressed up. Um, I, all I did was the Haftorah, though, because that was before I learned to read Torah. At Verbrengen? At Verbrengen, yeah. Huh. I mean, I, and... Uh, I probably gave a Devar Torah, but I don't really remember. That's, yeah, we were giving Devar Torah because I would do Truma every year, the the building of the Mishkan. Um, and I gave it often early on a Kabbalistic interpretation. So, um, but I remember that I was wearing, again, one of these long flowing Indian print dresses and everybody's dancing around me and draping me with their tali tote as part of this. And uh, and we I guess we had a big potluck lunch afterwards, or else I had it in my apartment. I actually don't remember, but I remember the sort of ecstatic feel of it all. Yeah. Did um, your family come, or was it? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, although I mean, for me, as for a number of people, um, the Chavara movement was the substitute family for the rejected, too American family, too assimilated family. Um, and the, the, these communities were, for me, the chosen family. Uh, but my parents came, and some cousins came. I mean, they, we didn't have a lot of family in Washington. Right. So. Um, were women at that point wearing Talaisen and at Kippot? Not everybody. They were actually, it was years till I wore a kippah. Um, 
I didn't wear a kippah till 1988 on a regular basis. And that's because when I moved to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and had to join a shul because there were no alternative minyanim there. When you became a professor, professor at Lehigh. Lehigh. Yeah. I mean, at, at, at Princeton, I davened at the Hillel with Eddie Feld, you know, who was also a very important person in the Chavara movement. Um, uh, and all that time I had been wearing a talus but no head covering. Um, one of the, the most respected elder guy at Bris Sholem said to me, this is this, no, Bris Sholem, yeah, it's not at, in Bethlehem, the conservative actually said to me, he said, isn't it interesting, you know, uh, you know, it's true that the mitzvah of tzitzit is in the Torah and the mitzvah of covering the head is not in the Torah. That is, giving me the benefit of the doubt that I had a good reason for this. I said, I'm not going to disrespect these people, and I started covering my head. That's why. Why weren't you at that point? I don't know. Didn't I, I can't understand it, actually, because now it's so natural to me. Right. Um, uh, but as Rob Agus also said, for women, covering your hair, covering your head was oppressive in the context of Judaism. You know, the scheidel, the head covering, all that kind of stuff. So maybe women didn't cotton to it as much. Although there were women in Verbrengen who wore kippot. And there were women who wore talasim, and there were women who wore neither of those things. Yeah. Um, were there uh, sort of women's talasim around at that point, or not? Yeah, like, there started the to be. I actually got a traditional talas, and I remember I bought the first talas. I went down to the Lower East Side, and I said it was for my chusim. I had to lie, I felt, to buy one for myself. And uh, the guy said, let me try it on myself so you can see what it would look like. I couldn't try it on. God forbid a woman should touch it. And he said, are you a base Yankov girl? I said, well, no. He said, and is your, is your chassan religious? I said, well, not so religious. He says, you know, a wife can be a big influence on her husband. So... Anyway, several years later, I lost that talus, and I actually was relieved because I had gotten it under false pretenses. But it was, I always wanted, mm -hmm. I always wanted the, the plain wool talus with the black stripes, you know. Although I thought it was interesting that people were making other kinds of colorful talasim, um, and men wore them too, eventually. Right. So I don't, again... Uh, so, to what extent were you or other people at Verbrengen um, associated with um, sort of the nascent Jewish feminist movement? Uh, we were heavily into it. Um, I did not go to the first Jewish women's conference, although some people did and came back. I went to the second conference. I was just rereading my notes from it. That was also in those that that notebook. I actually but tell us say what the notebook is. Uh, so yeah, so I, I uh, as I was preparing for this event, I, I was and also moving out of my house in Bethlehem, I was going over various archival materials I have, and I found a notebook that I kept during the year of 1973-74, which contains notes from community meetings at Fabrangen and notes from uh, uh, planning for Havara, for uh, Havara retreats, the inter Havara retreats, and drafts of explanatory things I wrote about for Brengen and, you know, as well as I was studying Yiddish with Max Tickton at that time, all my Yiddish homework. Um, and, and the last section of it is a dream diary for some reason. <laughs> okay, so that's the notebook. That's the notebook. So in this notebook, and there's some mimeograph materials, there's uh, newsletters from for Brengen and there are, um, uh, Letters of, of planning from the planning committee for the inter retreat at uh, Weiss's farm and other things like that. Yeah. So, um, so we're talking about um, that conference, the feminist conference. Yeah, so I actually wrote a very negative set of notes about it. I, I said I didn't really find any people here I liked. And um, actually, I mean, it was way too big. And it was about... It was hundreds of people. It was hundreds of people, and it was also called the first Jewish Women's and Men's Conference. It had men also. And... Um, this was the first or the second? It was the second. The second, okay. Uh, and it was... Um, 
uh, I do remember that uh, they they asked me to lead a reform service on Friday night, which I was a little reluctant about because I said I like a more traditional service. But Why I did they ask you to do that? Uh, creative liturgist. I don't know. I thought I could do something. I remember uh, who was it? Oh, what's her name? Oh well. Maybe yeah. Anyway, well known. Jewish feminist scholar of rabbinics who teaches at JTS, Judith Houtman. Yes. Okay. Um, I remember she came to my service, you know, um, just to see what I would do. I guess by then I had a reputation. Um, so, and I remember uh, doing uh, the beginning of the Amida in English with uh, including the, only the matriarchs, I think, instead of the patriarchs and the matriarchs. And I and I remember that I gave them attributes, the only one of which I remember is the eyes of Leia. Um, uh, and I remember Judith complimented me on it, but I didn't, I don't know, it, it was maybe too New York-y, it was too huge, it was a lot of people already knew each other, it was the New York scene. Um, uh, I apparently, I, I remember it more negatively, I mean, I wrote about it more negatively than I remember it. Was there a women's group that was sort yes. of taking shape, though, within her brain? Game? Absolutely, there were two. Um, so what were those about? What were they? So they were like a CR group, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, we met frequently, maybe weekly, maybe monthly, can't remember. We met, there were probably about eight of us in this group. Um, and uh, we talked about our lives. Uh, and that included our Jewish lives and included, I guess, you know, it's, it's hard for me to remember the substance of these discussions. But um, I remember people saying that these women's groups were the locus of a lot of, a lot of the creative energy in Fabrengen. That out of these communities of women came a lot of ideas, a lot of um, um, spiritual power, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. that we did, did stuff. Did women advocate for any kinds of changes or innovations as a result of these that you can think of? Well, this was, I mean, there was, there was in those days, and this certainly was important in my own scholarly life later, this, there was the beginning of the search for a usable past. You know, where are our female ancestors? I remember that Esther Tickton wrote a little essay on Tachinus. You know, that started me on a whole scholarly career in a book that I wrote. You had, know. You, had you known about Tachinus? I learned about them from Esther and Max, I'm quite sure. Maybe I had read about them in Life is with People. Um, uh, and, you know, there was a kind of search for what was the spiritual power, who was Bruria, you know? It was on a very elementary level because that's where the women's movement was at that time. Um, not just the Jewish women's movement, but people who are trying, you know, it's the great women of history stage. Um, and uh, so we didn't need to advocate for changes in Fabrengen. We had what we needed, um, but we wanted to know more. Um, and uh, we were very, you know, I can't remember what year Ezrat Nashim was, but we were... 71 or 2. Yeah, I think we were very proud to hear about that. Uh, we cheered our sisters on. Um, so we felt certainly that there was a great need for change in the Jewish community at large. Would you say that issues of gender and gendered roles were on the minds of men associated with Fabrengen also? Yes. Yeah. Was it the subject of community meetings, how to sort of embody that, the intentions? I would say that it was more the subject of things like Torah discussions, 
you know, how do you cope with the sexism in the part, in the, in the scriptures or in or tradition? The absence of women's voices. The right. absence of women's voices, that's right. Yeah. Um, that's what I recall. But you've also said that, nonetheless, despite the real egalitarianism mm -hmm. that existed, at least relatively speaking, mm -hmm. in Rengen, mm -hmm. there still was a preponderance of male leadership in leadership roles, men in leadership roles. Especially at the beginning. I think there was a shift as time went on. There were more women who could do things. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that was at the heart, in a sense, of what the issues were? Women not having coming in well, I think with that, the same skill sets that I they think have? well, you know, that was uh yeah, but I mean a lot of the a lot of the women who came in with good skill set came in with them a little later. Um were they younger? Is uh, maybe a little. Mm -hmm. Um uh maybe it's just a slightly different population. Um but Those and there were women didn't typically know how to read Torah, did they? Well, I don't know. Um, I certainly knew women who did, uh, and you know, I would say um, women with day school backgrounds typically did have a fair number of skills, even if they couldn't read Torah. Um, but in this period, yeah. They were, 73. Yeah. Were, you, were there many women coming from day school backgrounds? There got to be more of them as time went on. It, so it seems to me. I remember people coming. Would you say there was a perceptible shift that happened um, in the experience of worship as women took on more roles and gained expertise? and various skills? It's a good question. And I don't think I know the answer, really. I do, I mean, it's so scattered and anecdotal, my thoughts about this. You know, so it was women who did the modern dance, not men. You know, it was probably women giving Divrei Torah that raised more of the issues about women. Um, Did we use feminine God language at all in Fabrengen? I don't remember. Um, I know that we were excited to learn about people who were doing things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the years of all these things. I remember I got that experimental sea door by Maggie Weinig when she was a student at Brown. I don't remember what year that was. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, and she certainly had some. Um, I don't recall feeling as I was davening, oh, this is a women's service. Um, when did um, adult but benot mitzvah become a thing, so to speak? Was it in this early period? Well, it was. I mean, I had a bat mitzvah, as I mentioned, when I was 26. So that would have been what year? Um, 73. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I, was, I didn't do it as something that was unheard of. That is, I didn't, think, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to have a bat mitzvah. Nobody's ever done this before. I said, hmm, some people can have adult bat mitzvahs. I'm going to have one. So, but they weren't being done as a group. No, the they weren't a big thing at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and you're saying it was more an individual. Woman that's right. Deciding that she wanted to do this. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We were talking about um, adult bat mitzvah. No, yes. Um, right. Right. Um, and you were saying that you wanted to talk about the model of equality. Yeah, so I, what I was saying is that at that early stage, the model of equality was basically equal access. 
That is, we wanted equally equal access to previously male roles. We wanted to be able to be rabbis, which, you know, in 71, I don't think any place was accepting uh, well, women. Well, 72, Sally Priest was ordained. Right. Was ordained, okay. So there were, you know, but we wanted there to be women rabbis. We wanted there uh, to be women who could lead davening, who could read Torah, who could do the Haftorah, who had, who could take leadership synagogue roles. Um, I think the idea of women leaders as transformative was a little later. At least it came a little later to us. Um, that somehow the fact that women were going to be doing these things would change the character of them. And yet, it sounds like in the course of Excuse me. just communication that yeah. was happening naturally mm -hmm. and within these consciousness raising groups, mm -hmm. issues that did become the basis mm -hmm. for these kinds of transformations were already surfacing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looking at where women's voices were present or mm -hmm. not. Yes. Um, those yeah. kinds of things. Right, right. And, you know, I did do this, as I mentioned, this creative service in which I foregrounded the matriarchs, did a different kind of service. I don't remember when Larry Kushner's first feminist prayer book came out. Um, you know, we, a little later. Yeah, a little later. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, anyway. Um, so, one other thing I wanted to ask you was that um, you've mentioned this a little bit, but. Chavarach Shalom is often talked about in the service style at Chavarach mm -hmm. Shalom as being somewhat neo-Hasidic mm -hmm. in feel. And I'm wondering to what extent that description feels apt also for Fabrengen, and to what extent ideas and practices drawn, drawn from the Jewish mystical tradition sort of were present and consciously so. Well, okay. So... Um... I think we were proud of the fact that um, older people would come to our service and say, this sounds just like the service of my youth, because it had a lot of mumbling in it. Um, you know, they would say, you know, it didn't look like the service of they had known as in their childhoods in Eastern Europe, but it sounded like it. Why didn't it look like it? Because we were sitting on a circle on the floor. Something that basic. You can yes, get. right. Mm -hmm. uh, and also it was men and women together. Also we were, we were you know, wearing hippie clothes. Um, you know, cut off jeans or dashikis or whatever. So, um, so we felt very much drawn to um, a kind of, you know, I mean, as I said, you know, the... Um, the subtitle of my dissertation about the Germantown Minion is Ambivalence and Tradition in a Chavara Community. I mean, you know, making Judaism meaningful. Um, but uh, we, we, I think that there were some people there who had a Hasidic model. Um, David Schneier from his Karl Bach stuff. To a certain extent, Rob Agus, um uh, but it wasn't as pervasive by any means. Um, we might have studied some stuff about Hasidism, and I was always very interested in Kabbalah, and I would bring it in in various, you know, if I were giving a Dvar Torah or leading something at a retreat, and people were interested in it. But it wasn't experiential Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had been taught, as I mentioned, you know, about the history of Kabbalah, not about the experience of it. So I think one of the fascinating things about Kabbalah was it, it, the very different gender roles. That is, the masculine side, as you may know, is the sweet, gentle, kind side, and the feminine side is the evil, destructive, rageful side. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, and I remember giving a presentation about this, and I remember Rob saying to me afterwards, people just thought you made a mistake when you, when you said that, that you meant to say the masculine side. Yeah, yes, right. Um, so there was interest in that stuff, but I'd say it might have been more of an intellectual interest. I don't think our services felt Hasidic, but they did 
tried to feel traditional, and they tried to feel traditional in opposition to the shuls we grew up in. Meaning? Meaning, the congregation will rise. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Um, you know, or Adon Olam Asher Malach. So, um, so that's what we were opposed to. And we wanted something that was more intimate, what, what we felt was more authentic, what we felt was more related to a community in which you didn't need a rabbi to be a professional. With, you know, all of those things. Was Zalman so Zalman, an influence? Yeah, I mean, Max brought him down a couple of times. Um, uh, you know, and in those days, uh, you know, the, the Jewish renewal, I mean, here, this, uh, this is probably important someplace, although probably a later, it's a later period, but I was already doing Jewish renewal uh, field work at this point. But I remember I went to one of the inter the National Chavara Committee retreats at Franklin uh, Pierce College, so it's obviously relatively recent. But somebody came there who I who was somebody I knew from um, uh, Jewish Renewal. He decided to come and teach there for a change, you know, or whatever. So I asked him afterwards, how did he like the Chavara experience? He said, oh, he said, it seems so unspiritual to me. Um, he said, you know, he said, when I teach in Jewish Renewal, First, we sit in silence. Then, we sing a niggin. We open our hearts. Then, we study the text. Then, we process the text. We sit in silence and receive it and sing another niggin to close. He says, here, you go into a classroom, they open the text, they study it, and they close it at the end. So, I mean, there is that divergence, um, the charismatic way of renewal and the more cognitive way of the Chavara movement as it later developed. Um, you know, and Zalman, I mean, Zalman always wanted to be a Rebbe. He was a Rebbe, you know, and you could say Art also, Art Green was a Rebbe. We didn't want rebbies in our community, in, in, in the Fabrengen. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Max refused to be a rebbe. You know, if you wanted to know, I mean, because, you know, who do you want to Paskin Shilas if you have a halakhic question? You could not say to Max, what's the halakha on this? He would refuse that role. He said, let me tell you what the climate of halakhic opinion and the various the various traditions about this are, so you can make your own decision. Or so that the community could make a decision. So, uh, in Fabrengen, we were very anti-charismatic. For that reason? For what reason? For what? Tell me why. Um, it was our commitment to egalitarianism. You know, it was our commitment to, I guess, democracy as we saw it. Not sort of for depositing all this authority yes. within an individual. That's right. And also, of course, but you get a more charismatic service if you have a Rebbe. That's just anthropology. Right. You know, so... Um, Would there have been any objection to that, though? What, a more charismatic service? Yeah. No, I don't think so. It just didn't happen. Well, and it was part of this commitment to this larger yeah. principle. Something. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, not that we had, not that the services were boring, you know, um, but they weren't usually ecstatic after our first six months of dancing ecstatically to all along the watchtower. <laughs> um, uh, so. So summing up this yeah. issue of sort of prayer and liturgy and the ways the community came together for in, yeah. in that way. Would you say it evolved significantly over that first period of time? And how? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, in the very beginning, we didn't have Shabbos morning davening at all. We had a Torah discussion. And then gradually, 
we had davening which became the focal activity of the community. That was what you did to be a member of the community was to show up on Shabbos morning. Um, and um, uh, I'm not saying, you know, and, and it, 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 it could be powerful. I mean, you know, I remember, again, the first time I led davening and I led the Kedusha and I felt this powerful antiphonal kind of thing going on. For the first time, just as the davening leader, I remember we did Anim Zmiras, and um, I remember leading it, sort of trying to address God with raw passion. You know, I was in my 20s. <laughs> and um, thinking, all right, this is this gorgeous male God, you know, it's God, you know, black curls and you know it's everything that has all this very very physical description of god in anim smiras so um so um you know and i i would say so so i don't know i mean uh it's not that the services were boring you know but they weren't on that hasidic model I don't know. You have to ask some other people. They may remember it differently. You will ask them, or you have asked them. No, I haven't. Actually, yeah. you're the first of the uh, for bringing. For bringing, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's try to a little bit yeah. uh, focus on um, uh, for bringing as a study and learning community, mm -hmm. um, which obviously was another yes. key component. Yes, right. What would you say was for Brangen's vision for the role of learning in the community? Uh, I think to create more Jews who could do it themselves. More Jews who could take a fully egalitarian part. Um, that is, who could create Jewish lives for themselves. And I, this actually went on to become a much bigger part of Fabrengen after I left. I mean, you know, huge amounts of courses and things. I don't really know too much about it. But, um, but... We wanted to be able to give people skills and knowledge. Um, you know, I thought of myself as one of the educators. Mm -hmm. Was there, um, how did the Chavara envision the uh, roles of teachers and of learners and the relationship between them? Uh, once again, very egalitarian. Just because you could teach one thing didn't mean you couldn't be a student in another class. And I did both. So everybody basically saw themselves as both teachers and well, learners. Well, I don't know if everybody saw themselves as, as a teachers, teacher. But I mean, the teachers saw themselves as both teachers and learners. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, when was the peer-to-peer -peer education model that became part of the later um, National Chavara? Mm -hmm. um, when was that developed? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. All I know, it was part of it was part of the way we thought about classes. Even back then. Even back then. How yeah. so? Well, as I say, in Fabrengen, in those early years, I taught classes and I took classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, Was there a, any sense of an established curriculum or a range of particular classes that Fabrengen wanted to make sure were options for people who needed to gain skills? Or I don't basics? think that we thought in those terms in the early years. Maybe people did later. Um, except always offering Hebrew, um, which I think we did a fair amount. Prayer book Hebrew? Uh, it was very elementary Hebrew, whatever it was. Uh -huh. um, At least someone could read. Literally yeah, that's the, right. Um, although actually more people in those days could read the alphabet than can now. Interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the level of knowledge of the, uh, you know, it's, I mean, I know from the generations of teaching my students, you know. Anyway. Um, Your students as the university professor, you mean? Right. Yeah. There was a much higher percentage in the early days of people who actually could um, read Hebrew, that is, pronounce it, than there was later. Interesting. Um, you mentioned that... Um, before Max Tickton's arrival in 73, you were 
In fact, the authority within the mm -hmm. group on a variety of different Jewish texts and history, right, right. Hebrew, etc. Um, what was it like for you to have that role? I loved it. <laughs> and I felt very displaced by Max. Did you? Yes, I did. I did. I remember. I remember once, I didn't say this, but once, you know, Esther was talking about how, I, so here this gives you some some additional data. She was saying, you know, there's a, that there was greater knowledge in the community by, you know, 74, 75. She's saying that was good. She said, she said, do you want everybody still to be asking, asking Max all the time? And I said, I didn't say, but I thought before Max came, I was the one they asked. Um, Rob also was an authority figure because he had the rabbinic background, but I, I probably knew more, I'm sure I knew more texts and other stuff than he did. So, so that's not an egalitarian feeling. Those feelings, I'm sure, existed, yeah. whether they were subterranean right. or not. Um, uh, did you use your, I mean, was your authority basically manifest in cl actual classes, or did people come to you? For no, people, I say in <laughs> Torah discussions, people would appeal to me. Uh -huh. You know, what does the Hebrew mean in this text? Uh -huh. You know, we're reading the English, what does the Hebrew mean? Or, um, you know... Do you know any good midrashim on this, or where will we find them, or you know, or even you know, I don't really know things like that. What's the halacha about this? I had spent all those years being orthodox. I'd learned a lot of halacha, um, so um, I could explain that too. Jewish history. Did listening to how Max responded to some of these kinds of questions affect how you did? Well. I guess I was really intrigued by that which I mentioned before, which was how he would not give a halachic ruling. But I had not been in the business of giving halachic rulings. You weren't a rabbi. Either. I wasn't a rabbi, and I also, yeah, I wasn't a rabbi. Um, so I was fascinated by that. I was fascinated by that as a way of embodying um, a different approach to halacha, in which it was non-authoritative and was something developed by the community. Uh, turning back again to social activism mm -hmm. and the relationship to the larger community, uh, um, how did the place of political activism evolve as a focus of community concern and activity in, in the period after funding, UJA funding, stopped? You, you've already mentioned yeah. that it, it, the community turned more towards its own spiritual life. Yeah. I'm not the person to ask. So, it, what, but it wasn't like all around you all the time. It was. Uh, it, maybe it was. I just didn't pay that much attention to it. It wasn't interesting to me. That is, I shared the political views of the time. Um, you know, I, I um, joked about stealing books from the Library of Congress for the movement, whatever that was. I never actually did it. Um, I. Uh, you know, but I, it just wasn't, just wasn't where my head was at. Right. Um, <laughs> Arthur have, will give you a long answer on this. I will, and Zionism. Did, yeah. Do you have anything you want to add about Zionism? And, and this was the period of, you know... Well, we were at Weiss's farm during the Yom Kippur War. That's exactly what I wanted to ask you about. So, I mean, that was a powerful emotional experience. And Mrs. Weiss was really distraught. There was a Mrs. Weiss? Yes. She cooked. She owned the place. Um, and uh, and I remember her babka. Um, but Who was Mrs. Weiss? And why was she renting it out to you? I believe, uh, all I know about it is, is that there were a number of these kinds of kosher Jewish hotels at one time in various rural places. And um, this was far from a glamorous place. Uh, it's also possible that I went to a Habonim retreat there once. I think she rented this place out to Jewish youth. It's possible that her daughter was involved in some New York Chavura circles. Um, I don't know. Um, there was no Mr. Weiss when I knew her. 
Um, and this was her business, was renting this place out to Jewish groups. Uh, so, so we were, you were saying that this so was... she was, she was extraordinarily distraught. We were all distraught. Um, uh, and, um, she kept saying, oh, she was a Holocaust survivor, Mrs. Weiss, I'm pretty sure. So, I mean, she said, you know, it should be good for all the Yiddish kinder. You know, she was, you know, she was, she was really caught by this. Um, and I remember we were all anxious. Um, there certainly was no sentiment during the Yom Kippur War that, thank God the Arabs are striking back or something like that. There was no feeling... There may have been certain kinds of ambivalence, but at that point, you know, 73, was it? 73, 74, yeah. 73. I mean, 67 to 73 isn't a long time. There was no sense that the occupation was going to stay on along all this time, you know. Um, there was no sense that, you know, of what was to come. So... Uh, I think people were distraught that the opposing armies had struck on Yom Kippur. Um, and we were concerned about the Jews in Israel. Uh, so, um, that's my recollection of the Yom Kippur War. Yeah. Had you resolved your own feelings about Israel, at least at that point? No, it took me years. But that was really a personal thing. Yes. You know. No, it took me years. I went, um, maybe when I went back for an extended period of research in 1985. But by then I was already, um, I'd already left the, I was leaving the Zionist narrative by that point. You know, the, the picture of how the state had come into existence and the justifications for it. And I saw a lot of racism in Israeli society against Arabs during the time I was there. So that was a bit of a shock. What? You gave the Arab gardener a real glass to drink out of? Didn't you have a paper cup? So, yeah. um, The main focus of this oral history project has been on the early period of what became known as the Havarama mm -hmm. movement from 1968 to 73. And in this next and concluding section of our conversation, I'd like to focus on your thoughts about how this period of really intensive involvement with Fabrengen affected other aspects of your own life moving forward and also your reflections on um, its broader impact, mm -hmm. the broader impact of the Havara movement mm -hmm. of Havara on American Jewish life. Mm -hmm. um, so you were an active part of Fabrengen from its inception in 1971 mm -hmm. until you left to do your doctorate? Yes, I, I left I left uh, at the end of the summer of 75, or sometime in the summer of 75. And I enrolled in the University of Pennsylvania, and I moved to Mount Airy because I already had met people from Philadelphia at the inter retreats. And, I knew, and I knew that um, uh, there was uh, something called the Germantown Minion uh, at Germantown Jewish Center, and they also had Chavura Aleph, Chavura Bet, and Chavura Gimel, which were groups of families um, at Germantown. And I knew people. I knew Michael Mash and Rachel Falkov, uh, Mel and Shoshana Silberstein, and Bob and Katie Zimring. I think those were the people I knew before I came here. Um, and I, um, only looked in Mount Airy as a place to live. Oh, I, and I guess, yeah, Alan Lehman was here. Yeah, there were a bunch of people I knew from inter re retreats who were here. So, um, uh, so I moved to that neighborhood because there was a Chavara community. How did you decide to pursue this degree? You've been... Well, okay, so I did not really know what I was going to be doing. You know, as I say, I waited to be, uh, and I um, went, I couldn't find something, and I became a librarian, and I worked for all those four, five years at the Library of Congress in the 
uh, cataloging Hebrew and Yiddish books and also Albanian, but that's another story. And um, I had always liked folklore. Um, and I uh, was cataloging Hebrew and Yiddish books, but I really didn't know any Yiddish. So that year of, I guess, 73, 74, um, I studied Yiddish with Max, but Max probably told me about, uh, and I applied to the YIVO summer Yiddish program, which was held at Columbia in those days, and I got the library to send me. So you were... what? What was driving your interest at that point? It was your job in part, and so well, was, uh, well, I probably had. You know, I mentioned briefly that exhibit Portal to America, which I can't remember when it when it was put on, but it was about the Lower East Side, or maybe it was Gateway to America. I can't remember which, but I remember first of all that it was the first Counter Zionist narrative I met. That is in Israel. And in Zionism, the idea was that the idealistic Jews went to Palestine and the materialistic Jews went to the United States. And I, um, I uh, saw this exhibit and I learned about, and I did not know about, despite my curricula on socialism and Habonim, I didn't know about the Bundists, I didn't know about the Yiddish labor uh, movement and all that kind of stuff, and it kind of like that kindled an interest in me in that Yiddish culture. I'd also read Life is with People when I was in college or graduate school, which another interest in that. Yeah, um, another twist of fate. I won an award in Hebrew school, and I, they gave me a copy of Life is with People as my award. And I, somebody else got Glotzer's Hammer on the Rock, a Midrash reader, and I think... Had it been switched, I might have gone into Midrash. You never know. Um, but anyway, I became interested in Eastern European Jewish civilization by reading that book. Um, and uh, anyway, um, I, um, or that's how I remember it. I have to check the dates on this. But in any case, in any case, uh, so... So you went to Yivo, you said, to study. Uh, to study. And I was in the second year of the second, you know, like I was in Yiddish 2, not Yiddish 1, because I'd studied with Max. And we, David Roskies was one of my teachers. And we read some Hasidic tales. And we read one of the tales of Rabbi Nachman, I think. And we read some other popular 19th century Yiddish literature. Um, and Barbara Kirshenblatt Gimbel was teaching there, although I never met her. She was teaching an advanced course on Yiddish ethnography. But I heard about her. And so at that point, that fall, I decided I would apply to Penn um, and apply to the graduate program. I came up, I talked to Barbara, actually, um, and uh, did it all at the last minute, thereby not getting any fellowships. Um, but I did, I did get in, you know, and, and I realized about the second year of graduate school that what I really wanted to do vocationally was study Judaism the way a folklorist studies things. Which is what? Uh, the Judaism of ordinary Jews, uh, with some attention to aesthetic expression. So, I mean, you know, originally I thought I was going to do my dissertation on Jewish food, and as I joked, invite all my friends to the orals. Um, uh, and various things happened, but in the end I decided, I, I got interested in Tachinus, I was already interested in Tachinus and Yiddish women's prayers at that stage too, um, but I decided to do my dissertation on uh, the Germantown Minion. Um, and especially with a focus on the evolution of ritual, changing ritual, what davening was like, what Torah study was like. And, um, and people said to me, don't study your own community. Why not? I said, well, <laughs> there were good reasons, but anyway. Um, so, um, so I don't know exactly where we were here. What's the question? 
um, how you decided to pursue this degree. Yeah, so that's how I decided to pursue the degree. And I took... Um, and how you got involved. In yeah, and I got, and I got, I mean, I moved, I was involved with the Minion right away from the day I moved in. And um, secondly, I guess, uh, I mean, I took folklore courses and I um, also took uh, two courses with Art Green, one course with Art and Zalman and on the Tales of Rabbi Nachman and one course with Judah Golden while I was there. So I did a kind of Jewish studies minor. So, uh, um, and Art was in the Minion at that time and Zalman was partly in the Minion and partly doing his own thing. So overall, how would you compare your experiences at Fruebringen and, and later at the Germantown Minion? How, how, and if you say something about the relationship between the two as as minions, as and also so, as, as Kabbalot. If although yeah. you said that everybody at German time minion wouldn't necessarily see themselves as Kabbalot. Yeah, because we were getting into the era of what were called what were they called the independent minionim. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, um, I was very intensely involved with the Germantown minion, especially since I wrote my dissertation about them. Uh, so, I mean, I, I mentioned this in my um, questionnaire. I found the emotional tenor of the Germantown Minion, especially at the beginning, refreshing. There were more people across a wider range of ages. There were people with kids. And there were people, a lot of people in Philadelphia who were like um, human services people. Uh, social workers, teachers, they knew how to process a meeting. Mm -hmm. At Verbrengen, we had these intense community meetings and we'd all end up crying. <laughs> yeah. um, that didn't happen in Philadelphia. I thought, oh, you can have a community meeting and not cry. Everybody, everybody expresses their own point of view and it gets heard. What did we cry about? I can't remember. Um, but... Um, but there was a kind of youthful intensity about Fabrengen. Probably a lot of you could say um, uh, long sensuous hugs among the members. People in Philadelphia didn't do that, as I found when I first tried to hug Rachel Falco. The way I had hugged somebody and she sort of pushed me right away. <laughs> Um, so, um, there was a kind of, you could say a sexual tension or an erotic tension that may have underlain for Brengen in those early years that I didn't find in Philadelphia. It was just a more mature group. And people were, there were... A lot of married people. Married. A lot of married events. people. Yeah. There were some people who were married. And, and through the time I was there, people got married and started families. Maybe they were doing that in Verbrengen by then too, you know. But um, uh, but there were some people who were just older. Uh, so um, and then of course the the what became the Germantown Minion had started a year before I arrived in seventy four. It was called the Library Minion then. We met in the library. Then it started meeting in a classroom. And what happened was that it was an enormously successful community. And in the early days, a lot of feeling of tolerance for whoever, you know, somebody wanted to lead a davening that was really traditional, that was great. And somebody wanted to lead something that was Sufi dancing, that was great too. The community grew by leaps and bounds. We called it the Yerushalayim to Pennsylvania. Um, the Jerusalem, like, like Vilna was the Yerushalayim to Lita. Yeah. People were flocking to the neighborhood. 75 was the year Art Green moved into Mount Airy from West Philadelphia. Zalman moved in that year. Um, there were a lot of RRC students. But people came from all over. And whereas we might have had, say, 20 or 30 people coming to the Minion in 1975, we had 75, 80, 90 by 1978. And then... We had 
which I wrote about in my dissertation, we had the we had um, schisms and coming back together, and people would say at community meetings, now they cried at community meetings again, they would say, I used to leap out of bed on Shabbos morning to come to the Minion, but now I just lie there and cry. Somebody said to me, you should call your dissertation Paradise Lost. What was going on? Well, I mean, what was going on was that once you had 75 or 80 people, you no longer had tolerance be between, between somebody who was going to do it full traditional davening and somebody who wanted to do Sufi dancing. And, or meditation. It's no longer, oh yeah, that's my friend Brian Walt, he wants to meditate this morning. Great. Or, that's Bruce, I can't remember what Bruce's last name was. Um, you know him, he loves to do a traditional davening. Okay, even though I find it a little boring, we'll do that. But we all have Shabbos dinner together, we all hang out together, we all take care of each other's kids and borrow each other's cars. Once it passed a critical mass, people began to stigmatize the groups. Those are a bunch of ignoramuses. Those are the drips. Um, how can, what about standards? That became a big thing. Standards, how can you have somebody lead davening who isn't going to lead a full davening or doesn't want to or doesn't know how to? Um, so over time, the group split, came back together, it split again, um, and eventually, I mean, there are many intermediate communities. Now there is Mignon Masorti, who are the traditionalists, who have a full, and this is where I daven, where there is a full traditional davening and a full Torah reading. No one-third triennial cycle for them. No, we're going to sit there and read it for an hour and a half if that's what it takes. Um, and um, there is uh, Dorshe Derek, which is now Reconstructionist, has a lot of students and faculty from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in it, as well as other people. And it has more of what we use as a Reconstructionist Sidur, but it's more of what we used to call a Chavara style davening, which is no Musaf, um, a more participatory Torah, dis a Torah discussion that's a Torah discussion. At Masorti, they have a Devar Torah. And no discussion? Uh, sometimes there's a little discussion. But discussion is no longer the heart of it. And um, um, the... Um, uh, so, uh, and they have, I think, a uh, discussion, kind of gender egalitarian rule that if a woman speaks, she calls on a man next and vice versa, a procedural rule. But I haven't been up there very often. I mean, I come up sometimes at Kiddush. We all circulate sometimes at Kiddush to say hello to people in the other Minyanin. This is this all taking place in one building? You're yes, it's all in one building. They would not let Panay Or in. Germantown Jewish Center. Pnei Or wanted to meet in the building too, but it's because they had a rabbi, Marsha Prager. That is, um, they had their own rabbi in the community. Our rabbi is the community's rabbi, even though he doesn't daven with the other minyanim usually. Which would you say our, is our Germantown Jewish Center rabbi? For a long time during this period, it was Leonard Gordon, who of course is now in Boston. Uh -huh. And now is Adam Zeff, um, and he is the commu the rabbi of the shul, and he leads the service in the cherry sanctuary. Although once when he had a devastating loss of somebody dying, he just came down and dobbin quietly with us. Nobody to ask him questions, nobody to, he didn't have to be a public person. You know, and he does come down sometimes on second day yuntif or whatever. I mean, you know, and he probably dobbins with Dorshe Derek on occasion too. So you have... You have the three groups. So I mean, so I guess what I would say to sort of go back to some of your original question is um, being in the Chavara movement has had a profound, utterly important influence on my life. Um, I still regard myself as a Chavara Jew as opposed to some other kind. 
even during the 26 years I lived in Bethlehem and belonged to a conservative shul, I did not really consider myself a conservative Jew. Um, that the principles of um, egalitarianism, of do-it-yourself Judaism, that we can take responsibility for our Jewish lives, um, of um, study are still important to me. Um, the Judaism as, I would say that for people who come to the Minyans, the Minyan or Dorshe Derek regularly, I don't know about the Cherry Sanctuary, Judaism is probably the single most important influence in their life or the single most focus in their, the most important focus of their lives in one way or another, whatever their careers are, whatever their family obligations are. Maybe I'm wrong, but Judaism as a way of life, you know, and you know, look, I go to Mignon Masorti, the level of knowledge there is extremely high. You know, um, there are a number of people who have rabbinical degrees who daven there. There are other people who are professors of Jewish studies. Um, there are other people who may be doctors or lawyers, but are um, had profoundly powerful Jewish educations. Um, so, so, so anyway, um, and. And I guess, you know, so it's a little disjointed, but I remember once, probably in my early years in Philadelphia, I went down to visit my, yeah, it was probably in 77, 78, something like that. I went down to visit my grandparents who were then living in Miami Beach. And they took me to Shul Friday night. It was an enormous Shul. I said to myself as I looked around, holy Moses, there are more people in this shul than there are in the entire, on this Friday night, than there are in the entire Chavarah movement. And to my mind, it was a horrible service. Um, the central part of it was a young lady who was becoming bat mitzvah. And they practically put a spotlight on her. The choir began to sing Afen Pripachik as she slowly walked down the aisle like a beautiful bride. And in fact, that simile was evoked by the rabbi. We say, we hope she will soon be walking down the aisle as a Jewish. She um, came up. He publicly scolded her friends in the front row by saying, you know, well, their parents never taught them how to behave in shul. She did the blessings before the Haftorah the first two sentences or three sentences of the Haftorah, the sentence, the last sentence of the Haftorah, and the blessings after the Haftorah. This was on a Friday night, and that was it. That was her bat mitzvah. And I'm thinking, this is where the Jews are. But I do think that the Chavara movement and similar, similar currents within American Judaism have had a profound effect. You know, I, I, you know, later in my life, I go to reform temples where I could be at a renewal service. You know. Uh, you know you, so, not only on your personal life, but yeah. in your professional life, mm -hmm. the Chabra, your experience mm -hmm. in the Chabra had. Right. Since we were starting to talk about the way in which um, your experience and for bring in uh, impacted mm -hmm. not only your personal religious right. life, but also your professional life. But I, before we get to that, I just want to go back to one other thing, which was you were talking about the ways in which um, f f you, you continue to see yourself as a Chavarad Jew. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if um, there were any ways in which you find that your religious, your, your, your religious life, your inner religious life, mm -hmm. Um, or your outer religious life, for that matter, has has diverged significantly from what you would consider the you know that sort of original chavura kind of. Um, well, I, I have come to prefer a very traditional davening, although egalitarian, um, and uh, I'd say that a sort of classic chavura davening has more. Um, 
interpretation in it that I'm interested in now. That is, it has people giving covenant. Our covenant for this part of the service is, you know, whatever. Minyan Masorti doesn't do that, and I am not interested in anybody giving me, in most cases, covenant for parts of the service. I'd rather Can do you it say myself. Just a little bit more about that, because we didn't discuss that earlier. Yeah, we and saying. I don't really know when that came in. I talked before about the readings. I know that actually early on in the Minyan, and I think still in Dorshe, but in a lot of Chavura style Minyans, there still is a way in which the service is punctuated by um, thoughts about the meaning of the service on that particular day by the person who's leading the Shliach Tzibor. And that that's part of the job. I'd say that's still part of the job in renewal often. But also, I think in other Chavura style minyanim, that people you know, so, will say something before shacharit. What does shacharit mean today? Or before a particular prayer, mm-hmm. um, give a kind of interpretation of it. Um, and at the minyan, actually, we actually do that on the high holidays, that somebody does give a kavanah for different parts of the surface. That's the only time we do it. Um, and sparingly. Uh, Are there many members of your current minion who also have a Chavura background, so to speak? Uh, some members of it were members of the original Germantown minion. Um but not that many. Let me not kid myself. There's actually one couple in there who were members of Fabringen. You said that um, the Germantown Minion members don't necessarily consider themselves a Chavura. Jews, but more independent, right. independent Minion. That, I think that that's right, and I would say that the people who are in Dorshi Derech also don't consider themselves Chavura Jews. They consider themselves Reconstructionists. So what's happened there? What's where's that? Uh, I think that <clears throat> part of the shift. I can't speak to Dorsche. Uh, part of the shift is um, from community to davening group. That is, as people have other aspects of their lives. There is still a powerful sense of community in the Minyan, although it also extends to the larger shul. Um, But people are less involved with each other outside of shul than they once were. Um, I would say that as people have gotten older, more tired, more busy, there aren't a lot of Shabbat dinners anymore at people's houses. There's some. How does that play out in your personal life? Well, um, my wife is not very mobile. So if we have Shabbat dinners, we tend to have them here. Um, And (coughs) I invite people from the Minion on occasion, mostly very old friends. Uh, and there are a few people who invite us. Um, and there's some people who would like to invite us, but Nancy can't get up the steps. Yeah. So it's, a, it's in, a, in a smaller uh, <coughs> right. sense. The, the... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but there isn't that sense that there was when people were young couples and their kids were all friends. I mean, another important aspect of Germantown Jewish Center is um, the early childhood program, which was created out of the Minyanim as people began to have kids. And it was created as a community need, and it's been a, uh, it's been a great kind of um, uh, community resource and w- means of connection among people from different Hudaban in different places, because their kids are all in the early childhood program. Um, 
what was the connection here? Anyway, <coughs> but as peoples, <coughs> as people who were in the original community now have grandchildren, um, they're just not no longer in the stage of life as we all were in the in the late seventies, the early eighties when we were, you know very intertwined with kids and families and all that kind of stuff. You, you mentioned um, in your pre-interview questionnaire that um, sociologists of Judaism mm -hmm. do often make distinctions between the Chavarot of the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s right. and the independent millennium of the 80s that followed. What's the basis of those distinctions and why do you, you said personally, feel like it's more of a continuum rather than two separate phases, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> I realize I'm asking this yeah. as in your scholarly. Yeah, question. no, I understand that. I guess, um, so partly it's a matter of um, my own sort of personal predilections for seeing continuity and connections. It's the way I, I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm not, even though when the conflict broke out in the Germantown Minion and people said to me, aha, now you'll get the really good stuff. I thought, oh no, I don't want that. Um, so, I mean, I see real continuity from the Chavarot through the independent Minyanim, through the current egalitarian Minyanim, you know, who are so, I mean, actually, they're no longer so current, but, you know, the DC Minion, all these, uh, you know, kids in their 20s, 30s, whatever, who are so anxious to disavow that they're anything like the earlier Chavara movement. Although, are they? I mean, are they so anxious to do that? Yeah, they have been. And why is that? What do they see as the big distinctions? Uh, they're firmer. Um, okay, that makes sense, for sure. But... I don't think they are that different. That is, they're, they're, sure, they're different in certain ways. But I think the impulse to have your own davening organized by your own community rather than by any authorities is common across all of them. And is... Um, Anyway, to me, that's the chief aspect of continuity, that we're not going to leave this to the professionals or to the charismatic leader, which is the difference between that and renewal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so. Do you see, so you, you did your dissertation on um, the German town meeting. You yes. went on to study Trinus. That's right. Um, and and then you also came sort of back, back to do more ethnography. What brought you back in that, which feels to me like a continuity, I must say. Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, to a certain extent, it's, you know, for a while you talk to living people and there are a lot of problems with that. A lot of good things about it and a lot of problems, you know, they can get mad at you. Some of my friends stopped talking to me when I was studying the Germantown Minion. Friends uh, within the Minion? Yeah. I can't invite you to Shabbat dinner if you're going to be analyzing it. I said, I can't turn it off, you know. Um, uh, and uh, so then you study dead people who can't talk back to you. Um, and then you get an itch to study living people again. Um, I think that also one of the things I discovered about the era of the Tachinus was that it was an, an important era of the popularization of Kabbalah. And that... What period is it? Uh, 17th, 18th centuries of the period I studied, and that there were, you know, the Zohar was translated in parts into Yiddish. There were, they, a lot of this was the Sabbateans. 
Um, they taught women Zohar. There was a lot going on there in which Kabbalistic ideas to an extent were made available to lay people, including women. And so I think the idea I got for studying Jewish renewal was that this is another period now of the popularization of Kabbalah, and that was a place to study it. It was a place where I knew people. Um, I thought I could get access. I mean, I wasn't brave enough as my friend and colleague Jody, um, oh, now I can't remember her last name, that's terrible, uh, who studied the Kabbalah Center in Los Angeles <clears throat> and wrote a very good book about it. Um, I didn't have the nerve to do that. Uh, but I um, I thought, you know, let's see what Kabbalah is like. I mean, and when I started out studying Jewish renewal, I got really, uh, that was what I was looking for, was how do they use Kabbalah, how do they popularize it? Later, I got interested in many other aspects of it, including, um, and I also, my respect for Jewish renewal grew during the years I did field work there. I actually started out kind of denigrating them, um, partly from my Chavara point of view, you know, uh, denigrating charismatic leadership and whatever else. But I began to see, first of all, that they attracted people who had tremendous artistic talents. That people who they attracted, it's, it's the old sort of cognitive intuitive divide, but they attracted, they attracted people who, um, who were wonderful visual artists, dancers, storytellers, um, uh, very creative. Uh, they did foster an intense spiritual experience. I had experiences at at Jewish renewal retreats I've never had any place else, you know. Um, as any anthropologist will tell you, if you do the techniques, they work. Um, and, <laughs> uh, you know, after a while, I was much better at setting up the barriers. But, um, but especially the first couple of years of my field work, I mean, I was just blown away, you know. So I remember the first retreat I went to, Shefa Gold was leading it, and she said, we're going to work with some altered states of consciousness, you know, and I said to myself, I don't believe in altered states of consciousness, but by, by the end of the weekend, I was in one. So, <laughs> so I, I really learned respect for that mode of being and for its intense spirituality, which, of course, is something that has also drawn me. But, um, but I never... Um, wanted to commit myself to renewal full time. I really too cognitive for that. Um so Do you still consider yourself a spiritual seeker? I don't know that seeker's the right word for me. I, I never considered myself a spiritual seeker. I don't like that word. Um I consider myself somebody to whom spirituality is an important mode of religious expression or experience. Um, so, um, so you said early on mm -hmm. that, um, for Brangen, when you first encountered it, it seemed to embody your collective sense of, the, co the collective sense of excitement and creativity of, mm -hmm. basically of that, your whole of yeah. the generation in shaping a yeah. new form of American Judaism. And then from your vantage point now, personally, professionally, to what extent do you feel like it, it lived up to that vision? Uh, partially. You know, I mean, the world didn't change entirely as a result of the 60s, but it did change some. <laughs> uh, and I would say that many more Jewish congregations have a participatory model now than did when I was growing up. Is that because of the Chavara movement or did the factors that changed congregations also produce the Chavara movement? I can't say, you know, because um, I, I, here's something I wrote in my, in, my, in my questionnaire that I think, again, it's important to, to, to mention and that is that, at least in my view, the Chavara movement had a tremendous influence on Jewish academia. 
And from there, it influenced others. You know, I mean, Arnie Eisen is the head of the Jewish Theological Seminary. He was a Chavurah Jew at some point in his life. He may not consider that to be the main way he's Jewish, but it can't have not had any effect. You know, I mean, Paula Hyman, um, uh, Steve Cohen, may he live and prosper and be continue to proliferate his studies. Uh, you know, for whom I have the profoundest respect. But I mean, he's, he, you know, the whole field of the sociology of Judaism, you know, profoundly influenced by Steve and other people who, Bethany Horowitz was in the Chavarah movement, you know. Um, so, uh, I, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, even Sam Heilman, who's Orthodox, did a stint in, in the Boston Chavarah at some point really? early on. Um, I, you know, a lot of people who have shaped the academic discourse on Judaism and the policy discourse on Judaism um, have been members of, participants in, at some, the Chavara movement at some time of their lives. Mm -hmm. What what um, was the importance of the Chavara movement in the development of the discipline of Jewish studies? I'm not quite sure how to answer that. What I'd say is that's it's. I mean, you know, I haven't thought about it. Um, you know, I think about the range, Bob Goldenberg and, you know, biblical and post-biblical Judaism, Gershon Hundred and Polish Judaism, I mean, Larry Fine and Kabbalah, I mean, Danny Matt, um, uh, so I would say that for some people, that interest in Hasidism and Kabbalah sent a lot of scholars into those fields. And that was primarily a Boston influence. But also you've got the literary scholars of the New York Kabbalah. You've got, you've got Alan Mintz. I mean, um, Gershon Hundert, I mean, is interested in Hasidic history too. I mean, you know, it's, it's like... Um, partly it's a matter of field, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, there probably is something about an approach to Jewish studies, but I have not thought it through. Yeah. Um, mainly I have just thought about the tremendous number of good people who went into Jewish studies who were also in the Chavara movement. Right. right. And finally... I wanted to ask you about the uh, what impact you would say the evolution of Jewish feminism had on the Chavara movement over time, but also the ways in which were there ways in which you think the Chavara movement influenced the directions in which ideas about women's roles and places evolved. At the time, the feminist movement and the Chavara movement seemed to me to be deeply intertwined, the Jewish feminist movement. Yeah. That is, I, all the people I knew in the Jewish feminist movement who were also in the Chavara movement. Exactly. I'm sure there were, I mean, there were other people in the Jewish feminist movement that mm -hmm. I didn't really know who came at it from other, you know, what was it, the Brooklyn Bridge Collective or whatever. I mean, there were... Um, Uh, you know, uh, so there were other groups of Jewish feminists, but I mean, you know, I I was never in Benot Eish. Um, that is, I went to the first meeting and I didn't keep going. Um, <clears throat> but I think that Benot Eish, which had a lot of people from the Chavara movement in it, uh, should I say what Benodesh is? Yes, please. Um, <coughs> it was a gathering 
of Jewish feminists at um, a retreat center in Cornwall, New York, a Catholic retreat center. And I, I suppose they'd still meet there. I don't even know. Um, over Memorial Day weekend, which is, I suppose, when they still meet, and which is why I never went back, because we always had a family reunion on Memorial Day weekend. I didn't want to miss. <coughs> anyway, Jewish feminists who who um, spent the time playing with feminist ideas, even crazy ideas, whatever they felt like. And I think that they brought some of that creativity back to their local communities. Um, you know, I mean, a great many people were in that community who were uh, from all over the country. Uh, I guess for many years I've been a little um, sad that I never continued with it, but I didn't. Um, and not everybody in Benodesh was in the Chavarau movement, but a lot of people were. And uh, so I think that that, as a Jewish, powerful Jewish feminist nexus, did influence the Chavara movement, whether it was in liturgical creativity or other ways. Um, and Renewal founded its own group like that called Achayot Or. Um, so, but I don't know very much about that. And when was that, more or less? <sighs> Must when? be at least 15 years ago, maybe more. So, but much more recently. Yeah, I think so. I don't know, actually. I'd have to ask. Yeah, but still uh, more recently. Yeah, then, and then Benodesh. It was, it was modeled on Benodesh in some yeah. way. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to add about the impact of uh, the Chavara on yourself personally or on the Jewish world or the mm. world beyond the Jewish world? Yeah, uh, I won't say anything about the world beyond the Jewish world, I don't think, although I do remember seeing a Catholic equivalent of the Jewish catalog in those early 80s or late 70s. Um, and, you know, and also, you know, the accusation against us, Chavara Jews, was we were the pick and choose Jews. And, uh, and I remember uh, talking to people who said, oh, yeah, we're accused of being cafeteria Catholics. So um, I don't know whether it was influence, but it was certainly part of a wider movement. Yes. A wider movement of a different approach to religious life. One in which um, people had more internal authority. Um, as Arnie and Steve say, the sovereign self came to rule. Uh, you know, that's an influential book. Um, and uh, uh, I, um, uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I guess as a scholar, I would have to say that questions of influence are just not entirely clear to me. I mean, influence on myself I can talk about, but societal influence, you know, there's a whole move in American society towards a more experiential religious life. You see it in everything from evangelicals to charismatic Catholics to, you know, Chabad. Um, so I can't say that the Chavara movement caused these things in Judaism. Other people will be quicker to say that there are, you know, people in Jewish renewal are always claiming that they caused the turn towards spirituality in American Judaism. I, I'm not so sure. Um, uh, you know, that in a certain way, American Judaism has become more like the ideals that we had is certainly true. But what the reasons are, I can't tell you. Yeah. Um, and that may be yeah. a good place to end. Yeah, yeah. So, Chava, thank you. This has been a really wonderful and fascinating conversation. I hope we haven't worn you out too oh, much. Oh, no, that's okay. I could talk about these things forever. Well, I'm so glad, and thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, well, my pleasure. I look forward to reading some of these other, or hearing some of these other interviews. Yeah, they'll both uh, be available. Both yes, right, and... Uh, 
Well, I'm sure you'll get a very different picture from Arthur tomorrow. It will be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs>